Hi, this is Lawrence Krauss, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. For this podcast, I have my guest, uh, Dr. Akim Olushehi, who is a astronomer and physicist, and also president of the Black Society of Physicists in the U.S. Uh, his story uh, is a remarkable one. Uh, if you had to pick someone who you would imagine would never get to uh, college, much less uh, post-college experience and then becoming a faculty member at a university in physics and astronomy, uh, you would have picked uh, Hakim. Uh, he's written about it in a, in a book that he, he produced a while ago. And we, do, we talked about his origins and, the, and not only the things that got him interested first in science, but the many, many challenges he had to overcome uh, to become a scientist. Uh, it's inspiring and enjoyable and, and, and actually also uh, he's, a, he's a remarkably pleasant and, and jovial fellow to talk to about this and, and other things. We also talked about a more recent experience of his that another challenge he had to face in a remarkable piece of work following the claims made by some people that James Webb was a, was a homophobe and racist who, who uh, while director, uh, well, administrator of NASA had uh, um, excluded those people and uh, from from positions and also spoken out against them. Uh, Hakim did a, uh, a remarkable piece, I would almost call it investigative journalism or historical journalism. He was at NASA and he uh, went through all of the materials to see uh, if this was corroborated because he was quite concerned when he heard it. Uh, and what he discovered was that, of course, the claims were untrue. That, for, for that, he should have been celebrated. What, what, what happened immediately afterwards was he was vilified by the same people who've been promoting this notion that the James Webb Space Telescope name should be changed, who, who acted in an anti-scientific manner in the sense that they, they assumed the answer before they had the evidence. And he, he provided the evidence and it, he didn't have a, 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 a position on this. He just wanted to find out what the truth was exactly as a good scientist or scholar should do. And he was vilified for it in ways we talked about and, and um, uh, unduly. And, and so uh, I think the lessons we learned from this are that, that you keep, your, keep focused on the truth, keep working hard, and that you can overcome a lot of difficulties. And also, uh, once again, to be willing to change your mind in the presence of evidence. It's a great uh, discussion. I really enjoyed talking with Hakim, and I hope you enjoy the discussion as well. Uh, you can watch it uh, without advertisements on our uh, critical mass or you can watch it after that on the youtube channel for the origins podcast either way i hope you uh, enjoy it you can also of course listen to it on any podcast site and by the way if you happen to be in southern california on uh, uh, october 15th or 17th the origins project will be having two events you know, one in santa ana on the 15th and another in san diego in San Diego, I'll be joined by Brian Keating, and we'll be filming actually this podcast and his podcast uh, at the Air and Space Museum there on the 15th at the Bowers Museum in Santa Ana. And I'll also, by the way, be lecturing two days earlier in Vancouver for those of you up north. So I hope I get a chance to meet some of you in person as well. With no further ado, our podcast with Hakim Olyushehi. Okay, Hakim Olyushehi, which I think I got right. Okay. Pretty close, pretty close. Great. It, yeah. It's 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 really good to have you on. I wanted to have you on, talk to you for a while. As you know, we've been going back and forth. And yeah. I have to say, in all honesty, the, 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 what, what originally I wanted to talk to you about, and we'll get to it, is James Webb and the James Webb Space Telescope and the supposed controversy regarding the naming of it, which you played a, yeah. a key role in. I And I also wanted to talk to you and I will talk to you because you're president of the National Society of Black Physicists and yeah. I want to have a frank conversation about that as well yeah but this is the origins podcast and yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen any of it but what I try and do is go into people's origins at the beginning to try uh, and find out what got them turned on to what they're doing and I and I was going to do that but uh, and I and I have done that but you 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 helped me in a way because what happened is um you said, by the way, I got this book called The Quantum Life, uh, My Unlikely Journey from the Streets to the Stars. And I asked for a PDF, and I spent the last four days reading it. And so I now know about your origins, which are even more fascinating than I had assumed. So I want to, I wanna, before we get to those things, 
And yeah, I also yeah. want to talk about your work as well. Yeah, nice, I want to nice. I want to talk about what what sort of ultimately led you to become the man and the scientist and writer that you are. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, so the first thing I knew was that before before age 13, you'd been to lived in a whole bunch of places, the Ninth Ward uh, of New Orleans, Watts, South Park, Houston, Third Ward. Of, is that the third ward of New Orleans or Houston? Houston, Houston third ward. And all, yeah. all awful places to be. And then and then rural Mississippi. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you, your book begins with when you were four years old, when your family got busted apart for the first time. Yeah. And um, and it, it, you you had this experience of growing up in both what one might call urban ghettos and yep. r- the rural backwoods of uh, yep. of. New Orleans and and then and and, and, and Mississippi in particular, yeah. And I I found it obviously fascinating. Uh, your your unlikely journey is indeed an unlikely journey and a remarkable indeed. one, a, a truly yeah. remarkable one. I found the read fascinating. I also found the it interesting. I didn't. I was wondering whether I would notice specifically when when in your writing, your when you quote yourself mm. when you're younger. Right. You're quoting yourself as, and, and the way you speak is very different than when you quote yourself when you're older. That's I assume right. that was with, with malice of forethought or you intend the, the, the way. Yeah, you... it's, it's, right. So I wanted to be true to my voice. Right. And so yeah. my voice evolved. Like I showed up in graduate school. So I was in Mississippi from the age of 13 to 24. Yeah. Before that, I was in inner cities. OK. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, all of these places have their unique accents. New yeah. Orleans does. Right. So, man, I show up to Stanford University at the age of 24 for graduate school and no one can understand a word I say. <laughs> OK, so I, I, you know, I basically have to change the way I speak yeah. in order for people to understand me. Yeah, and, sure. and, and I'll tell you what's funny is that, you know, I love, you know, I, I, I love the diversity of human cultures. And, you know, yeah, America yeah. has so many subcultures yeah, yeah. And, and my deep woods location. I just love to take people there. Right. Yeah. And when I do, they all react about the same way. O- around day two or three, they'll put me to the side and they'll go, Hakeem, do you really understand what these people are saying? Or are you faking it? <laughs> you know, you know, my ear is trained, you know. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's funny, you know, people change the way they speak. And a lot of people think it's sort of yeah. a feat. Uh, and it really is not. Uh, there's, it's not the case. I remember my wife lived in Australia. Mm. And her accent, she was, grew up in America, but she, her accent was very difficult to place. Mm. And what and she worked for the government of Australia. And what what she said was at some point, it wasn't a matter of wanting to suddenly have an Australian accent. It was a matter of being understood by the people you work with. Right. That was exactly that's exactly it is 100 percent. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm still cursed on occasion, you know, but (laughs) there's so many different features of of your upbringing that I want to hit on. But one Mm. I want to start right away, which is before we get to the I mean, and, you know, there's so many obstacles. There's there's parents who break up, there's poverty, a little access to good education, drug dealing, so many, and potential violence all around you, all of those things that you yeah. might imagine uh, for a, a, a poor black man, young man in, in many places, and for a poor yeah. person in many places. But yeah. one of the things I ask people who become scientists is to what extent reading impacted on their becoming scientists. And in your case, it, it, you know, the first thing that comes out is 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 how reading saved you and you want to tell the story of the book of the month club because i kind of found that kind of an interesting one yeah so you know i i discovered i fall in love with books and uh i have this older friend darren brown who is is pretty successful in his own right he he grew to be the highest ranking african-american in the u.s navy submarine fleet and his last post was to um run the, the, the Navy base there at Ames in, mm-hmm. in, in San Jose. But, you know, Darren was a couple of years older than me. He was a smart kid and he was like uh, giving me advice. And so one of the things he told me was that as a minor, I can't be held accountable to a contract. Yes. So I signed up for Time Life Books, you know, and I received these books on, you know, the weird stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the irony of it is I grow up to write a book with Time Life Books. Yeah. And, and I, I confess to them. They're like, okay, we forgive you. <laughs> By the way, I had a subscription to Time Life Books when I was younger. First, you were Book of the Month, but then yeah. I had all the Timeline books. In fact, it's 
it's not behind me, but it, but there's a bookcase where you can see all that. I have the 24 volumes or whatever it was. Oh, it, wow. it took yeah. me many years to get them. And when I, and they were one right. of the first, I spent my entire allowance on them, but wow. before that you had book of the month, but I think it's a great idea that you, yeah. now, but I forget what, how you knew you wanted, you love books because there was the Bible in your house, but yeah. was there something else that you saw before, before the book of the month club? I know that roots eventually no. played a role, but yeah. So that's long the fact. Yeah, so long before that, I was a um, seven-year-old in mm -hmm. uh, elementary school, and my sister was in middle school, uh -huh. and she brought home Edith Hamilton's um, mythology, oh, and okay. man, I just ate that up. You know, I loved everything superhero, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so a, a year later, you know, I'm living in New Orleans, and there I am with Darren Brown, and you know, Darren and I, you know, Darren is teaching me everything. He's teaching me how to play chess. He's teaching me how to play football, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and we're in the woods. But the next year, I get to Mississippi, and I'm introduced to comics, Marvel and DC comics. Com My cousins, I was going to say comics. That's right. Yeah. They have crates and crates of comics, yeah. right? So up until this time, I'm not really, you know, Edith Hamilton is as close as I've gotten to reading an adult book. Yeah. But, you know, again, there were the time life books that had, sure. you know, ghosts, you know, Oak Island, Loch Ness Monster, all this weird stuff. Yeah. I loved it, right? Yeah. And th at the same time, you know, once I moved to the country, once I moved to rural Mississippi, man, when winter hits, you know, it's a lot more boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> I live in Canada. I don't think rural Mississippi oh. winter is exactly the same, but anyway. <laughs> it's all relative, man. It's all <laughs> yeah. relative. You know, it gets down to 60, you're free. You know, we had a fire, you know. 60 and we got our our, our T-shirts on anyway. Uh, yeah. my, it would be 80. My Aunt Minnie, who I live with, she'd be like, build a fire, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but man... I was so bored this, you know, at this time period and everybody was talking about this book roots and lo and behold, there it is in the house. And this is the first time I really read a novel, a, a, an adult book. Yeah. And it really just blew my mind mm -hmm. and how vivid the pictures in my mind were, how emotionally invested I was in the story. And sure. so, you know, coming out of it, it was like awakening and being like, you know, whoa, that's awesome. Let's do it again. Yeah. It's all, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, well, well, you know, I want to come back to that in a second, but the, the, you yeah. mentioned comic books and I'd forgotten about that part. And, you know, I, I, again, used to spend my weekly allowance with my brother. My brother would get me to spend my weekly allowance on comic books that we both read. But, it, but, uh, but, you know, that's a great way uh, of young kids beginning to learn to read and, 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 oh, yeah. and, and, you know, I encourage that, you know, who cares what the subject matter is? It's a way That's of right. getting gripping with stories. And, and, yeah. uh, and then the root story. Yeah. You're it's as far as I can tell, it was the first book that really grabbed you and to go way ahead. I was going to talk about the yeah. end, but it might as well in some ways it, it, in the circularity of where we're going to go on the story of your life, yeah. it had yeah. an impact because ultimately you changed your name That's and right. to some yeah. extent, um, it, it, it's because of, of course, uh, the, the hero of roots it, be, being forced to change his name. You know what, man, I did not have that thought until I was writing this book, you know, oh, really? as, as I'm thinking about my life and, you know, tr you know, I took a year to really like think that, you know, Josh, the guy I wrote sure. the book with, you know, we spent a year just talking about these stories to try yeah. to narrow it down. Cause I had like a billion, yeah, uh, not literally anecdotes, yeah. but how do you create a, weave a narrative sure. out of it? What are the important stories? And, you know, I started to see things that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And once I, I you know, I, I talked about how big that story of Kunta Kinte and being forced to change his name, the big emotional impact it had on me. Yeah. And as I was thinking, I was like, wait a minute, could that have influenced me when I decided to change my name? I, I can't say that it did not. I can't say that well, it did. Let me but ask it's you, what did you think? Well, what, whether it influenced you or not. Yeah. Uh, jumping ahead, we might as well, since we brought it up, yeah. you did change your name rather late, right? In the at last years of graduate school. That's right. Just before yeah. getting your PhD. Yeah. It's nice to have a new, I mean, having your PhD automatically sort of creates a new life. So if you're going to, right. in some sense, ha reinvent yourself, that's a good time. But yeah. what was, what, was it more than that? What what caused it at that instant and nowhere yeah. not before or after? You know, man, a big part of it was that I felt like I was a new person. Like mm -hmm. that's the yeah. reality. But For you know, sure. when I showed up, you know, I, I had been in, and this is relevant for this time, right? Yeah. Because when I get to Stanford and I discover their libraries, talk about books. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. Green Library became my second home, yeah. if not my, my, my primary home, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're born into this world and we're given all these narratives. Yeah. 
And, you know, I would hear all these narratives about, you know, so there is like what school is telling me, but there's what the older brothers in the hood are telling me. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they pull me to the side and they say things like, well, you know, black men created civilization, the black man, you know, and I'm like, what the hell? And I felt like, you know what? Let me find out for myself. Let me Mm -hmm. get into this library and unwind human history. I want to under, I wanted to, you know, I used to play this game with people, you know, tell me a year, tell me a century, and I'll tell you who the dominant powers were in the world, what was happening at, you know, pretty much Eurasia and Africa at that time. You know, rest of the world, I really didn't have a good view on. And I wanted to understand human religions, right? I wanted to understand the, not just the, 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 Western traditions from the fertile, from the Levant, right? Yeah, yeah, Judaism yeah. and Islam yeah, and yeah. Um, Christianity or the Eastern philosophies of Hinduism and Buddhism, but also, you know, what was going on around Africa, what were the Native American beliefs? Mm-hmm. And so I, I did all of this studying. And at the same time, I'm learning everything that humanity knows about the natural world for the most part as a physicist, yeah, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. this history, this physical world, and man, let me tell you, it was as if I took my head poured out a lot, <laughs> everything I was born with, right? <laughs> Refilled it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm this new dude. Um, and, you know, I want to claim, because I also did have that idea of self-determination. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you what's funny is, funny, not funny, but, you know, I always saw myself, I'm African-American. Clearly, I'm descended from slavery. Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that there's not that much in my ancestry, right? I, You know, once we did our family history, it turns out my mother's paternal... On both my paternal lineages, Mm -hmm. my father's paternal lineage and my mother's paternal lineage, there was no slavery. Mm -hmm. But on the maternal lineages, there was, Mm -hmm. right? So it's a, but even then, you know, my father's mother is, is, you know, half Choctaw Native American, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you, you know, so as I'm doing this studying and I find out my father's lineage, what's really crazy about it is that both of his grandfathers were Irishmen, white Irishmen. Interesting. Right? Wow. Yeah. Now you want to hear something that goes against the narrative? Get this. His paternal grandfather, his father's father, had two families. He had his white family and he had his black family with which he had four kids. Four kids. The, w- one of whom was my grandfather, Charlie yeah. Plummer, right? Okay. But here's the crazy thing. All right. My dad was born in 1933. Mm-hmm. I don't know what year his dad was born, mm-hmm. but this white guy clearly is born some point in the mm-hmm. mid 19th century. Yeah. When he died, he left us, his black family, a ton of land in Mississippi. That's the land I grew up on. Wow. The plumber land in Clark County, Mississippi. Wow. That that does go against the narrative, doesn't it? You're supposed to have been forgotten when he dies. Yeah. He's supposed to be like, oh, I don't claim you, right? But no, he, 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 he... provides the land that I grew up on. Well, but, you know, this is good. Uh, There are a number of times I want to, I want to talk to you and sort of challenge the traditional narratives or at least ask questions. Because right. the big thing, I mean, well, you got the right guy. Well, and I hope, yeah, I do. I think I do. And you got the right guy for me in the sense that yeah, nothing yeah. is sacred for me. So I'm going to ask yeah, questions. Same. And some people say, how dare you ask that question? I'd say right, nothing's right. sacred, buddy. Every question is. is yeah, we got asking. two uh, nerds that, you know, feel like we're from another planet. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look at the, okay, good. Look at um, objectively, not like well, we're members of the human species. The, the, before we leave the books, which we and yeah. we've sort of circled around them for a while, but this right, is great. Yeah. I have no you know agenda in, in yeah. that sense. You went from the novels, though. The one thing that really I, I was intrigued by, and it was clear yeah. to me that that was your desire to have an encyclopedic knowledge came from the fact that the first books you really had access to were encyclopedias and you yeah. ate them up. You got, you oh, got this man. world book encyclopedia and you started to read it from A to Z. And, Absolutely. And, that was and the plan. as far as I can tell, been obnoxious to everyone around you by telling them. Absolutely. Every- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My mom, you know, my mom had to pull me to the side and, you know, inform me, you know, <laughs> how to interact with the humans, you know, you know? <laughs> especially, you know, in the deep South, man, a kid correcting an adult. Yeah. If they say something correct. You know, that that's not going to fly. You know, you, that could. That- <laughs> especially if you correct a teacher and which which I know right. you did. And I, I remember I, I had that experience. Yeah. But for you and yeah. especially I don't. And there may have been a different dynamics with, with if correcting a white teacher. And we'll we'll talk about that. I, mean, I don't know if yeah. I think most te- many teachers were offended either way if a kid would correct them. Independently. Right. Right. But there may man, have been even more yeah. if it was a, if it was wasn't a white kid. Only at this one school, man, at this one school is one teacher in Quitman, Mississippi. And, you know, that's the that's the other thing about the narrative that is you know, that is interesting is that, you know, whatever group of people you you interact with, they're going to be people that are going to be great to you. And they're going to be people that are going to be awful to you. Yeah, right? yeah. Most people it's are going to be, be a spectrum and different. Right. There's yeah. going to be a spectrum. Right. So yeah, I, I ran into that person 
that was awful to me in that way that happened to sit in a teacher's desk. Sure. Exactly. Now, if I had the judge teachers as a whole, love them. Teachers. Yeah, we're going to get to it because I, as far as yeah. I can see, teachers were incredibly important. I want to yeah. challenge the narrative because yeah. one of the things I want to uh, look, I'll, I want to talk later about many claims of systemic racism, which I don't buy. Yeah. And I want to yeah. talk to you about them because I, you know, okay. I'm happy yeah, to learn. But, 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 yeah. uh, um, but yeah, the, so the World Book Encyclopedia, you you correct people, you always, you know, you correct people around you. And that was great. That yeah. was, I love kids that do that myself. <laughs> and, and I, you know, cause I, cause in, even in my new book, I point out that the one thing that parents and teachers don't say enough is, I don't know, which is, right. it, oh, it, yeah. you always got to seem to know when you're a teacher and that's not yeah. the way it should be. It should not be, you know what? I don't know. Let's discover that together. Let's, let's, right. let, cause that's yeah. discovery. Yeah. But so, so the World Book Encyclopedia, but the other thing the encyclopedia introduced you to when you finally got to E, and I think yeah. it was under E and not A, it was, was Albert e. Einstein. Einstein, absolutely. And, and my that, pal, that was my that that was a huge, profound moment in your life. Am I am I right? Oh, absolutely, man. It was you know love at first read, love yeah. at first sight, whatever have you. Um, you know, I because think about it this way, right? I was so in love with the natural world. Mm-hmm. You know, I was watching Jacques Cousteau, yeah, Wild America. Sure. I just lived in the woods in Mississippi. Just, you know, I was just fascinated by everything. Fire. I was a huge pyromaniac. Uh, and, and oh, man, in, in the country, you know, I had gunpowder, kerosene, gasoline, burnt our trash, had a fireplace. We were doing it all right. The natural world and weird stuff that I talked about earlier and I get from yeah. the Time Life books, you yeah. know, what's that's relativity, man. That's, yeah. you know, you bring those two things together, weirdness mm-hmm. and yeah. the natural world. And not only that, I now have this esoteric knowledge that yeah. nobody around me knows. Yeah, which right? just makes it yeah. gives you that superpower, which you've yeah. been craving in the comic books to some extent. That's right. Yeah. 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 So it all came together, man. But, it, it, you know, the thing for me, though, is that it was almost like a puzzle and a challenge at the same time because I wanted to really, really get it and understand it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. And I became obsessed with just reading, reading, reading and quickly realized, hey, man, I'm going to have to learn some math here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Eventually, you have to learn some math, and you have a yeah. bunch of times where people you were good at you were really good at certain parts of math, and your mother encouraged you to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, she was very excited when you could count well or saw and, and solve problems. You know, the thing about the uh, one of the one of my big discoveries as an adult scientist who yeah. in, also interacts with the education world, y- yeah, because I've come to understand that you get well educated in math by the time you graduate high school yeah. in one of two ways. Mm-hmm. Either it's in your house mm-hmm. or you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was neither. Okay. Mm-hmm. Most Americans are neither. But if you go to school and learn math well, oh, you got lucky, homie. Yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. But because the, the 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 mathematics of special relativity is so simple. Yeah, and really you know, is. it's high school. It's it's even well, depending on where you go. In right. Europe, it's it's middle junior, it's public school. In the US, <laughs> it's high school or university. Yeah. Anyway. But you know, I was able to reason my way through it. And so yeah, by the sure. time I'm like 14, I, I'm getting it, right? Yeah. I understand it. And yeah. and you know, computers come out, you yeah. know, and I'm yeah, and I'm 16. I'm like, hey, I can code this up. Yeah, we'll get to the science first because I'm trying to think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for you know, in many cases, I want to see what the key elements are that that makes mm. people scientists. But in your case, it's even to for the same reason you wrote the book. It's even more interesting because it's such an unlikely journey. Yeah, these yeah. things is a factor that that when we think of the kind of things we can do if we to help more kids climb yeah. out of of a future that's unfortunately determined for them when they're born. Otherwise. Think of what are the things that can help. Well, obviously, books are one thing. The other, the other, I'm gonna, they're two Darren things. Brown, man, a yeah, kid having a friend years older than me. Peer, yeah, one peer is one all peer. it takes. Yeah. All it takes one peer. I remember even yeah. when I was a kid, was a son of a, a neighbor who's an engineer who had a model of an atom. Yeah, you know, my mm. mother wanted me to be a doctor, so I thought doctors were scientists. But when I saw the yeah. model of the atom, I remember that, and and then it was a book on Galileo for me. But yeah. the all other right. thing, I'm trying to think of the other things that. You know, some people might have think of our disadvantages mm. from having come from where you are, but there were there were advantages because everything could yeah. be, you know, everything is cuts two ways. And in this world of everyone suddenly being a victim, people oh, realize yeah. that sometimes you know what you think of as a victim, it can be an advantage to you building yeah. a strength. I, I'll give you one example. Okay, I'll good. give you one example. <clears throat> I arrived at Stanford University. Mm-hmm. And I had spent the summer before at Berkeley working in Bernard Saddle's research group. Yeah, yeah. On the experiment that was old friend CDMS. of my colleague. Oh, nice. I worked, yeah, on, yeah. I worked on the papers you were working on later. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Wow, that was my very first physics research of my life. So I yeah. knew 
that I was vastly undereducated compared to everybody else from my Berkeley experience, right? I ran yeah. to Saul Perlmutter, yeah. who's a buddy, yeah. but you know, Saul as a postdoc at the time was not pulling punches. Let me tell you, yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he was being pretty frank. But anyway, okay. But I appreciate that, right? Yeah. I appreciate, yeah. I appreciate knowing where I near, need to shore things yeah. up. So anyway, I show up at Stanford, and I'm looking at different things about the people around me. Uh -huh. I'm looking at their intelligence uh -huh. and I'm looking at their education. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, what I see is that you guys are, I would not consider you to be intrinsically more intelligent than the people I knew that were uneducated. Yeah, sure. But you're way better educated mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. But then I said, but you know what? Can anyone in here outwork me? Because, gotcha. you know, I was forced to do hard manual labor. Like this moment you hit double digits and, you know, when you learn that resilience of I'm going to, you know, the pain doesn't exist. I must drive forward and get this done. You, we you both know. went to the same place. I was thinking I, I was thinking I was reading. I'm looking at my notes, your book. And you said that your rural backwards, rural backwards, Mississippi was a training ground for life as a research scientist. Heck yeah. You learn to work hard and you learn to work hard. And you learn to solve problems, man. You weren't, you know, when you didn't have money, you weren't calling somebody to fix anything. Yeah, yeah, you had to fix You were stuff. doing everything, no matter how complicated it was. And your father was. was, you know, the interesting thing is, again, one yeah. might think, okay, your father was was ultimately an addict. Your mother yeah. was, you know, Watch your mouth, Lawrence. I'll kick you. Anyway, never mind. Yeah, yeah. And, but <laughs> interestingly, they both were, you know, they so they were both negative influences in one way, but they're both incredibly positive influences in Absolutely. another way. Your yeah. mom, well, let's go your dad first. Your dad was knew how to do everything. You Okay. Yeah. And he, mm -hmm. and he, and he, and he taught you. Yeah. I think it's really a, a, a great thing. And, and often he, yeah. he, you know, you can see that influence in you and your yeah, mom for all yeah. of her other, you know, pluses and minuses was excited for you by, because of your intelligence yep. and encouraged it. I mean, there was a chemistry yeah. set at some point she bought oh, yeah. a computer, yeah. Yeah. you know, these are amazing oh, yeah. things. Yeah, you know, the whereas, books you would get me. Yeah, I, 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 it can go the other way. I remember, yeah. you, just to give you an example, I remember when I was a chair of a physics department at Cleveland, I tried to mm. get, and my university, we, we donated old scientific equipment to some of the inner city mm. schools that would, because they need it in Cleveland, there's nothing. And there was, yeah. but there was a really neat school there called the Cleveland School for the Arts, which was right mm. next to the university. And I used to go there and I was, a, I think I, I, I was, a, I was involved with it because we donated mm old physics equipment to their science labs. And, and I remember going to a play. I mean, these were kids that were gifted artistically. And yeah. I saw this girl, young woman perform and she was great. And afterwards I saw her come out and, her mother, and I just saw her mother yell at her. Why did you spend there? Why didn't you come home? And I thought, you know, that's the difference between a parent mm. who, you know, when your kid does excel to someone right. who just puts them down for excelling. And that's a, and, you know, wow. it's a really big difference. And so I was really yeah. pleased to see how tickled your mother was at a variety yeah. of times in oh, your yeah. life and how for your father, in spite of yeah. introducing you to drug dealing yeah. and, and ultimately <laughs> and ultimately yeah. becoming, you know, a, a, yeah. a, an unfortunate addict, um, yeah. Yeah. nevertheless taught you how to work hard, mm. learn things, solve yeah. problems. And and those yeah. are there was another aspect that I thought of that of, of being in rural Mississippi. Hey, you know, hey, I'm going to interrupt you here, man. Sure, you because I'll even, interrupt you. You interrupt me. That's even, the way it works. Even, you know, you say being a drug dealer, there's being an honest drug dealer. No, yeah. <laughs> he taught me how to be straight, yeah. square, professional, honest in that world. Oh, right? absolutely. Important yeah. things like not go out in the street and sell, you know, oh, all absolutely. sorts of things. He, yeah. no, he gave you wise street wisdom. Exactly. And, and exactly. Yeah. And don't cheat people because you're going to. It's going to yeah. come back and get you in the end. Exactly. No, no. It was. Yep. It was really. He, he taught you to be. In that sense, he was an entrepreneur. When, when he was he absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he yeah. was an entrepreneur. He was enterprise. He had. Yeah. He brought money to, into the house that was oh, yeah. essential for living, which were which which was uh, you know, and buying that that club. Uh, the oh yeah, like, would have called oh, yeah. the nightclub, I guess, and getting everyone working in it was. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was fascinated by that. But the other thing that it seemed to me that you got out of that rural, that one some people might think it was a negative was the night sky. I oh. remember the fact when you came from a city to suddenly the first time when you went saw the night sky when you were in the country, it, oh. it, again, Ooh. a pivotal moment. I don't know if yeah. it determined why you wanted to be an astronomer or an astrophysicist, but tell me about it. Man, listen, I, look, you know, I was amazed and I had no references to know, okay, here's what, you know, all I knew was the Big Dipper. Yeah. And of course, 
just like everyone else, thought the Pleiades was the Little Dipper, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'd see the planets, and I knew that there was something different and amiss with them, yeah. right? I didn't figure it out till Tugel that those were planets. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, you know. Meanwhile, too, so it's okay. In city, you know, where, so, cities where every where the air is so bad, you really can't see the fact that they don't twinkle, I and mean, you get yeah. Well, I didn't know this. You know, yeah. like like basically in the country, we had two channels: Channel Seven, Channel Eleven. Only Channel Seven came in for the most part until mm-hmm. people got to the point where you can get that antenna outside mm-hmm. your house where you go outside and turn the antenna. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like we literally do lived in a trailer in the woods, you know. Yeah. Um, and and so having information to tell me here is what I'm seeing in the sky, I did not have that. But as far as like being there and just being fascinated by it, right? Yeah. But here's the funny thing is that, again, as I started to learn once I went to Tougaloo, you know, I'd come home because, you know, they had a library. They had people that knew things about astronomy. I took an astronomy and, and class. Just for people, just yeah. for people or listeners, Tougaloo was the first university you went to. Some of them may have not heard That's of Tougaloo. That's right. Okay, but we'll get there. Anyway, Tougaloo sorry. College. I like to say it's so exclusive, we don't even tell people it exists, <laughs> right? Okay, so, perfect. Perfect. But it's funny because one of my good high school friends, this guy named Jackie Pugh, he passed mm-hmm. in 2022. But um, he was a hilarious man because once I started learning, you know, I wanted to tell everybody, you know, yeah, I'm being yeah. annoying again. Yeah. And Jackie, he would always say, you know, if I see somebody, know, I'm like, hey, you see that right there? Right? Yeah. And Jackie would always go, oh, here he go with that shit again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they would tease me about it, but they loved me for it, you know? Well, you know, I never, I, the interesting thing is it really hit me. Because it was a long, I lived, I grew up in a city and, you know, I, yeah. I liked that guy. I even had a telescope and I remember once doing Ooh. a little show with a friend of mine and we had each just telescopes, but I, I never really knew what the sky looked like for years and years and years because I never went to the country and, you know, and I, and where I live now, it's just, it's, I've, I have almost oh. 360 degrees. It's like living in a planetarium. It. It's just dark. And it's, it. But the first time you go out and see the night sky it, without being in a city, it's just a different experience. It's totally because it really it's not just out there. It's it's all around you. It mm. is almost it's a, almost it's if I believed in the word spiritual, I'd say it's a spiritual. Yeah, experience. man. I mean, you know, you feel connected. Yeah, you feel yeah, connected. And and I was just Southern thinking, Hemisphere for the first time. I, you yeah, know. It, I was just saying to someone, you know, I wrote in one of my books uh, yeah. in South America. You understand why. You know, they used to view the Milky Way as a river continuation of yeah. the Amazon. And the reason is why? Because it's it's around you. It's not just That's out right. there. And it's That's a kind right. of feeling you can't understand until you've seen yeah. it yourself. Anyway. Oh, okay. man. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Let, let me let, let, let's go to the next thing. I, the, I'm okay. trying to think of the things that I from reading your your, your history um, yeah. th- that that were important to developing you the encouragement to do yeah. math and your mom's encouragement to at least be good at counting. And, and, right, and, right. and accounting. Oh, the, mm-hmm. You know, I'm from a world where nobody know, really knows what math is. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, you know, at Tougaloo College, you know, when I got there. So first thing was, I went to the Navy after high school. Yeah, right? yeah. We've and been. there, you know, I was in this program that was designed to take un- enlisted people and turn them into officers, yeah. right? And so the way it worked is they gave you a year of academic and really hardcore military mm-hmm. training run by the Marines, mm-hmm. right? And there were two math classes, the regular math class and the mar- remedial math class. In the remedial math class, we were taken. Through, from arithmetic through calculus in one year. I have atopic dermatitis, which you're not allowed to be in the Navy with. Yeah, that's, I didn't that's know the reason that. you had to leave. The reason I had to leave. Yeah. But luckily, I learned algebra right before I got yeah, kicked yeah. out. That's what you medical. said. The Navy gave you algebra and yep. also exposure to systemic racism. But we'll get, maybe we'll get yeah, there. But yeah, those yeah, are the two yeah, things yeah. the Navy gave. But it, it was great. I mean, it gave you, and a kind of a new kind of discipline, although. We'll right. get to the. I, I love the definition, oh, yeah. Mr. Cross's version of dif- this. Oh yeah, we're going to get to. Man, in I was already at a billion times. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> phrase, and I think we'll repeat it right now because the other thing I want to talk about is that the other thing that was really important, and I've met and I've mm. talked to a lot of scientists and other people, you yeah. know, about the importance of teachers, and I've been, I've oh, been yeah. amazed for some people, um, like my friend Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said teachers yeah. didn't matter to him; he had no good teachers. Yeah. But right. for right. the rest of us, we did, and for you. You oh, were yeah. the beneficiary of a few yeah. key good teachers. And, and the mm. other thing was interesting mm. was a number of them are white teachers, right? Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, and I remember later on, you were surprised when you went to a sign to the music camp yeah. and you got these prizes that people weren't, that people respected you, you know, they weren't, they were white yet. They gave you all the prizes and you thought, wow, should yeah. they be prejudiced against me? But you didn't expect it in the scientists, which I thought was interesting. No. So early on you'd yeah. been, you had this experience of these, 
and it's you're probably right. A bunch of these guys came down to the Freedom March and decided to stay. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. But Mr. Cross, well, Dr. Teal, the, yeah. the, um, McGinnis, Bruno. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I throughout the book, I'm impressed by all of these teachers who really not only put their faith in you, but went out to bat yeah. for you and, and really took you under the wing and said, yeah. I see something in you and yeah. I'm going to help. And, and so, yeah. and I think, um, man, you know, that's the, you know, that I, I hate where our country is. So Lawrence, you know, I've been to 44 countries at this point in my life. Okay. You know, I didn't, I didn't leave until I was 32. Wow. All right. Now I'm 27. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> you're still a baby compared to me. I want you to know that. That's all, all right, right, all right. Okay. So um, I see that every country has these identity hierarchies, right? Yeah, and so sure. the thing that 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 was interesting to me, you know, when you live in a single locale, you buy into the 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 one of your location, and you buy into the one that's recent, right? The ideas yeah. that are recent, you yeah, know. Sure. And so it, it gets painted with this brush. And sometimes in your cultural narrative, you're still living the fight of three, four generations ago. Yeah, yeah. Right? And 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 so, like, I'll be honest with you. You know, when you talk about narratives, yeah. when I left, so we, we talk about the Navy and systemic racism. I'll give yeah. you an example of what it is. Yeah. What it really has to do with, man, I think in large part is character. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> if you're a bully, if you're somebody that's going to pick on somebody, if you're somebody and, and they're around us, right? Yeah, they're all Most right. people are concerned with themselves. There are a few people yeah. that are really good. And there's a few jerks out yeah, there, yeah, right? Okay. They're looking for the vulnerable. Yeah. Or the who those who are perceived to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example of myself. Before I left Mississippi, man, I was pulled over by the cops. I left at the age of 24. Okay. Dozens of times. Yeah. You know, between 15 and, and 24. Like, it was yeah. routine. Routine. You know, by the mm -hmm. time I met Tugel, it was like, lie down, search your pockets. All right? Yeah. I go to Stanford. I start speaking differently. Yeah, okay. I dress differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I get pulled over by the police. Uh-huh. It plays out completely different. Yeah. The second I start speaking, they're like, oh, yeah, I noticed that you swerved a little bit. These are, you know... Mm -hmm. Because I'm no longer perceived as vulnerable yeah. as as like a late teenage kid who dresses like he's from the hood and talks like he's from the hood. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. You know, so the 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 and, and you know, these people can be anybody like, well, man, I've been forcing people's perceptions in advance and people people, you know, you, we all whether we like or not make quick assessments exactly. of others. And one yep. of the first ways where they dress and the way they speak, I mean, it's just can't exactly. Happen. You know? Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 you know, that's what I say about too, about going to Stanford. One of the greatest lessons I learned was class camouflage, right? People would see me like five miles away. Oops. It's one of them. <laughs> but now they're like, Oh, Dr. Olushe, come on in. <laughs> oh, Speak to the president of the country, the CEO, you know, and it's yeah. just like, hi there. Yeah. They're, like, they're like, Oh, I'm your big fan. Like, Oh, yeah. T crumpets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, the, 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 um, but, I, how you interpret things is based on your narrative. Yeah. So sure. when I left the South mm -hmm. where I did experience, you know, because think about it this way, I'm having conflicts with black guys and white guys. Yeah, here sure. There, exactly. Right. Yeah. I'm having black guys who love me and white guys yeah. who love me. Yeah. Right. Okay. But what are they going to pick on you about when they come at you? If they're trying to hurt you. Right. Yeah. So the black dude might say something about my crooked teeth, my nappy hair, my big lips. Right. The white dude, mm -hmm. he's going there. Nine yeah, times yeah, out of yeah, ten in Mississippi, yeah. right? That's where he's going to go with it. Yeah. So, what you do to to self survive, to manage your own mind, you don't yeah. want to encounter those sort of statements, right? Because it hits yeah. you a certain way, yeah, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. So you know, like like somebody being like, I, I guess you say you're Jewish, which I didn't know, but if somebody says something anti-Semitic to you, uh -huh. it hits differently than someone just saying something jerky. Yeah, you know, for me, I guess it's just upbringing. And that's why I, I've said this before. It may be Same. a character flaw. All it did was make me think they were stupid. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I grew into that, right? Okay. I grew yeah. into that, right? Yeah. Because yeah. what I'm trying to do is, oh, if I hear this certain word, yeah. I'm supposed to lose my mind, get really angry, yeah. and yeah. be violent, right? Yeah. And then a after a certain point, I'm like, why? That's your problem. That's a yeah, you problem. problem. That's yeah, a, exactly. Uh, you, you, you own how you react to things like that. You, you own, own how you react Whether you feel like a victim yeah. Or whether you don't, yeah. in some sense. Right, right. Yeah. But when you're a young, man, when oh, that's yeah. the narrative that you're in. Yeah. So I leave Stanford University 
I mean, I leave Mississippi head to Stanford University at the age of 24, and I'm like, oh, every white person's a racist. Yeah. Though I had ample evidence to the contrary. So like I said, I had these white dudes that loved me. Yeah, like, yeah, and, and, like and, and all that, and the science fairs, and the music camp, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and all of the And I had plenty of black dudes that punched me in the face, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. We, we punched each other in the face. So anyway, what I learned, though, you know, because you have this racist radar to, yeah. to avoid these people, okay. and one of the things that trigger it is when people talk to you like they're superior to you. Okay. Well, guess how academics talk to people quite often. Yeah, guess yeah. how physicists in particular talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, so I had to learn. Oh, you're not a racist. You're an asshole, yeah. right? And it it, yeah. it impacts me. You know. And yeah. so, but you know, now as I mature and as I age, right, I get to cultivate the humans with whom I interact. Sure. Exactly. And you know, they run the gamut. And and what I see is if we look at our narrative publicly. You know, you think we're a country where everybody's at each other's throats yeah. over partisan politics and race. Yeah. But in my everyday, man, that is not what I experience and see at all. You know, I interact with people of, you know, that are extremely liberal, extremely conservative uh, and, and everything yeah. in between. You know, people of all races and, you know, we're all getting along. And, you know, a big reason is we're all well fed and housed, right? <laughs> you put us under some stress, things may change, but... You know, yeah, yeah. again, I'll jump ahead, but you know, obviously yeah. what your second father figure was your PhD Art supervisor, Walker. Art Walker. And yeah. he said it, you know, he said something which, which, which I think was really important when you, when you're talking, when, when, when you talk about, you know, you, 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 uh, the, the experience of, of having, you know, the failure in the, in the, in the graduate, uh, qualifying exams and, yeah, yeah. and what appears to be people taking it out on you. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Cause having yeah. been a professor, I'm going yeah. to put on the other hand and say why one might have assumed that you were ready to fail. But anyway, yeah, yeah, but he, what yeah. he said was an organization is like a bell curve, but it's not just an organization, it's society. It's society. In the center of the vast majority, they're indifferent. They're apathetic. Yep. They're self-centered. That's just what you just said. A small minority will help, and there's a small minority that will be hostile. Don't let that small group of doubters derail you. And and I yeah. think that's the key point. If we Absolutely. always look, well, in any organization, we're going to find people who are assholes. Yep. And if we and if we label them and nothing else, we're going to say that there's a systemic something in that thing where, in fact, it's just a spectrum. And part of yeah. being whether you're whether you're African-American, whether you're Jewish, whether you have red hair, whether yeah. you're a woman, whether you're gay or mm. whatever, is to recognize that uh, that if you assume that everyone is reacting because of a certain trait rather than just because who they are and, yeah. and, and, and learn how to deal with it, then you, then then the world just becomes uh, this view of power and 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 racism that just distorts it and and ruins it for you and everyone else. It seems to me. No, I I, I can I see what you mean there, and I agree with it in large measure. You do control how you react. Yeah, you, you do can. need the resiliency to say I'm not so fragile that you being unkind to me is not going to stop me. Yeah, it's not. Gonna, and the resiliency you are never going to be yeah. all well behaved, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'll tell you where the systemic part comes into it. And I think I said it earlier. Yeah. It's what is the default, right? So yeah. just like people buy into narratives. Yeah. There's a lot of narratives that are bought and, into. And so if you look at African-Americans in physics, right? Yeah. If there is a criticism, they seem to fall into typical categories, right? That seem to be reminiscent of how African-Americans or how black folks were represented you know, prior to us being a more enlightened society. Okay. And that is, you know, not as good mathematically, uh, not as creative and not as hardworking. Right. Yeah, I mean, you say that. Yeah. I remember you say yeah. that later on and, and it, yeah. and it's interesting to say that narrative. I mean, I guess I just. Like, for you know, example, I, I, I haven't had that experience. I mean, I think of, being good at math. Do, do, do people buy into my that? friend, Jim Gates, who I knew when, yeah. when I was at MIT yeah. and then Harvard. And yeah, then, I just saw him at, him at MIT a few oh, weeks okay. ago. Okay. And so Jim yeah. Gates is, is pretty yeah. fucking good in math. And, 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 and so I never, I guess I never, and, and everyone knew that. Let me tell you what Jim Gates said to me. What was that? Let me tell you what Jim Gates said to me. Uh, okay. So I left uh, academia and went to industry. Yeah. And then I decided this stuff is boring. I want to come back. I want to do some cosmology. Yeah. yeah okay. All right. So in 2004, I was at the University of Chicago and I had been seeing Jim Gates since the eighties when I was a, a undergraduate too, yeah. 88. Yeah. And Jim he made a big Walker. point that Jim was really good at trying to mentor. Oh and, Yeah. Always well, let was. me tell you what he did. He mm -hmm. walked up to me and my poster there on the Supernova Acceleration Probe yeah, satellite, yeah, if you yeah. remember that. 
like he had never met me in his life yeah. and grilled me on the hardware, <laughs> the theory, you know, the systematics. Yeah, yeah. And then after I answer all of his questions, he goes, good to see you. Right. He, <laughs> he, you know, good to see you. Right. So I say to him, I was like, hey, man, remember Cobley Institute was new yeah. at Stanford at the time. Yeah. They were hiring people, Roger Blandford, yeah, you know, yeah. and others. And I was like, hey, man, you think they're going to hire you? And Jim pauses and he goes, if you think these people will can believe that a person descended from Africa is capable of a creative thought, you have a few things to learn. Jim said no. That? Yeah, he said no. I do not expect that. I, I do not expect that invitation. That's hmm. what Jim said. So, man, you know there are people in our field that don't even talk to people that that don't have a PhD. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I know what academia is like. I'm, you know, yeah, I know but, the, but the, the, the thing is, is that and, you can't you can't wipe it with a broad brush, yeah, right? Yeah. You have to say it's this individual, that yeah. individual, this individual, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happens is, I'll give you another example. I sat on the NSF, um, you know, postdoc yeah. panel for many, many years, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, you know, at this time when I was doing it, it was a lot of uh, planetary exoplanet science, right? Yeah. And so I see these same letters from these same professors at these same top universities, uh -huh. and they make comparisons, right? It's like kind of the same every year. Yeah. Oh, this person yeah, is like, my top. I yeah, yeah. I used student. to write those letters myself, so I know. Yeah, yeah. But then they make comparison to other people in the field. And I noticed that one person who was who they were comparing with, like, oh, sure, they're way better than this person, was the one African-American guy. You know, and I'm just like, why is he always the foil? You know, I, I, you know, I'm just... You know, but I didn't do a systematic study of all the letters. It was a small sample, and maybe I found I just happened to get a biased sample. Yeah. But in three consecutive years, this guy was the, you know, and this guy has top positions. Has had top positions at multiple institutions, right? Yeah. Multiple top institutions. So, you know, it, in some people's minds, man, just like there are people that are anti-Semitic, there are people that are misogynist, there are people that are. You know James Webb, right? Dead white man. Yeah. You know, there, you know, there, there are people that Hakeem, you're wearing a blue shirt. I hate blue shirts. <laughs> Think of this: How often do you see a scientist on television that gets prominence like you and me that has a strong Southern accent, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's all these little biases that people have, and I think that's the real story. It's not that none of them exist; is that they do exist, but they exist more on. In you know, you have to look at things. You have to judge people individually. You don't sure. paint people with groups. Mm -hmm. And so that group I ideas that we have, because let me tell you, man, you know, I don't know if you've ever done interracial dating and got to live with people of other cultures mm -hmm. <laughs> and see what, you know, who they talk about, yeah. you know, but people have wild ideas. And, and even, I, you know, in my youth, I would think about people in groups, right? Yeah. Not as individuals, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people say they're colorblind, I, 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 I hope that's what they're saying, is that yeah. I judge people on an individual basis. Because yeah. I see, you know, I, I love the culture, the diversity, the, you know, I love to go to another country, yeah, eat their food, hear their music, do their thing and be them with them. I love yeah. that richness, right? Yeah. And so I love that, right? But we can't let that, you know, especially here in America, man, because as a pluralistic society, you know, and again, here's another narrative, right? How America's so torn apart, dude. Yeah. The way our country is constructed is a recipe for nonstop conflict, but yet we are peaceful as hell, right? That <laughs> well, I'm not sure I agree with the last part, but you're right. I, I think the recipe for nonstop conflict is built into the country. We don't have militias running around. Yeah. We're not. We're yeah. not taking up arms against each other yeah. in, a, in, a, yeah. in, a, in a systematic yeah. way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Not yet. We, it happened once, right? Yeah. And and you know, I'll, I'll remind people that was white people versus white people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you think about it, it, sounds like it was a race war, right? Yeah. So, you know, but that, but but it, it's not because if you look at, at modern society in America, if you listen to, uh, you know, if you listen to different groups talk about their politics. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a different reality that each group is living in. Yeah, yeah, know? I guess, and and you're absolutely right. And and there's and there and people, I, as I said, people pick up. People are used to certain things. People have stereotypes, not necessarily racist yeah. stereotypes, but we all have preconceptions of things. And the great thing about being a scientist that scientists should train you to do is ultimately be suspicious of your preconceptions, as we we'll talk about at the end. That's one yeah, of the things you, you can, learn over and over again. And yeah. it'd be great if more people just more generally learn to be yeah. suspicious of their preconceptions. And um, 
But I do worry about labeling as bad broth. I mean, brush. I mean, not just yeah. when I look at and you're you know I, I you're pretty frank about your history at at Stanford, and I know all the people because a lot of them are colleagues, and I've known them for. I mean, your professors, I've known them yeah. for a long time in one way or another, and you and there were people who who were hard on you and and yeah. maybe unfair to you that happens to everyone but the, yeah. but on the whole the community you were in ultimately and it wasn't just art i don't think ultimately no, uh you know treated you with respect ultimately treated you with respect as a scientist that you have ultimately gained and and um and so i don't i guess i, I it's not i don't the question is, is in what sense is there are, were there systemic barriers or are there systemic barriers? Um, when I read your history, yeah. um, I think of it as a, a, I mean, it's a heartwarming and, and, and such a, a uplifting story. It really is. Yeah. There's no yeah. doubt about it. I mean, throughout, I, yeah. you know, I would constantly smile. You, you were crying. You were crying. I well, know. I, you know, I don't know if I was crying, but I was, but I was, I was, I was smiling anyway. Yeah. To me, it's you, my more usual yeah. case than crying, although it's not. But anyway, so there were a lot of people, you know, you were sporting in high school yeah. and then, you know, the faculty, let, let, let's go, you know, why not? We're no, jumping all over the place. I'll say, you know, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, man. They, there was one person who was over the line. Yeah, over the line. And you talk about right? that one person, I think. But, yeah, you know, exactly. But but here's the other thing, right? The other thing is, is that, you know, it, it, it as a as a mentor, as a leader myself. Yeah. I have people that we oversee, not oversee. <laughs> that's yeah, maybe yeah, that's a yeah, bad yeah. word. But we, you know, we mentor, we 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 look out for them, we manage yeah. them. And one thing that I had to to figure out, and it's hard to figure out, is for this particular individual, what is the best thing forward for them? Encouragement or a kick in the pants? Yeah. Right. So for me, I'm the type of guy that if you tell me, oh, I don't think you can do it, or you're not you're good enough. Not. Yeah, I'm like, I'll show you, yeah. right? But that's not how the average person, in my experience, reacts. Yeah, yeah no, that's right. But yeah. I, I was yeah. reading your story, and I was, I, I was looking at it both ways because, uh, you know, when I was a student, I experienced some things that were not too dissimilar yeah. in one or two cases. Wait, and, but what? But then as a faculty member, I just remember when I taught at Yale, I yeah. just remember there were some students that we all, and I hate to have to do it, to hopefully yeah. say, you know what? It's it's really appropriate you leave the program, and then ultimately yeah. you you the, you you really felt like you were doing them a favor earlier mm. rather than later. The the earlier that they learned that they weren't really, it wasn't the right road for them. It wasn't shouldn't be the end of their life. It just wasn't the yeah. right direction, and it was hard to do. And and on paper, you know, after having to having to take undergraduate courses when you're a, a yeah. graduate student, and then and then not doing well in the exam first time. Yeah. After four years, I could see how independent of color or anything else, I would yeah. I would be willing to say, you know what is, you know, maybe maybe this isn't the right. I, I'd be what, Lauren, to... I'm, I'm going I'm to go to the premise of this topic here because yeah. it almost sounds to me like somehow you read. If you read my book, I never level an accusation of racism. No, you, no, 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 no. Absolutely, no, no, yeah, you don't. I, and it's right. and you you, you 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 never do. In fact, and and I think you yeah. take that attitude of arts that the, some people are going to be. I, I tell the story of here's right. what happened, and I don't go to their motivations of why yeah. things happen. And, and, and some and, people in there, you know, and, and so I'll give you. And, I'll, you're, I'll, and you're great, by the way. Let yeah, me just interrupt yeah. by saying. Yeah. The person who was probably in charge of the or, or, uh, the qualifying exams was the one who said to you, hey, you're going to fail it again. You should be prepared. You should get a master's. Yeah. He was trying to do the right thing. And then when you got a PhD, I know him well. He's a man I, I know like him a lot. well, Bob, too. Bob I can Wagner. see him today. And, yeah. and he said yeah. he was the first one to say, hey, congratulations. And, yeah. you know, the yeah. normally longer PhDs are worse, but yours wasn't. Yeah. It was great. And so. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. said he also went to say, but, you know, the publisher didn't like it. He goes, this is very significant work. Yeah. But no, listen, listen to this. Art made it clear to me at the time that he was not speaking for himself. He was speaking for the committee. Okay. When he gave me that talk about the three, three yeah. you know, that wasn't his words. That was the words of the committee. And what was happening, the dynamic at the time, was that there were two groups of faculty. There were the lower, the younger faculty who were not in favor of this thing that they had been doing mm -hmm. of, you know, because, you know, for people who don't know, between 79 and 89, Stanford graduated 30 black PhDs in physics not doing it through affirmative action, but basically recruiting the top physics undergraduates who were African-American come to Stanford. And they were motivated to do so because William Shockley 
was an outspoken he was a racist racist guy right <laughs> who, who, who you know made him look bad so that's what they were doing to, to repair mm -hmm. but you know by the time i show up right things are now changing the attitude is changing in the department and here is the thing right and it has to do with gatekeepers mm -hmm. and how they draw judgments on who is worthy to come through the gate and who isn't so here's something that i've struggled with mm -hmm. as an educator so there was this one young lady in my class when I first started teaching. My very first, I was working in Silicon Valley, teaching at a junior college. And this young lady, her first name was Teresa, Latino young lady. Man, she worked her butt off. Mm -hmm. Sat on the front row of the class, asked me all kinds of questions. Did not get it mm -hmm. at all. Okay. She earned a C and I gave her a C. Okay. And I regretted it from that moment until today. Right. I should have get you know I have that I, after that I put in a a, a bonus like uh, you know the sort of class participation thing points so I could swing yeah I know and, but like, but would it have been a favor no I I don't know I mean I I talk a lot look you know ultimately are you gotta is it growth too much is it than, growth I'm not saying coddle okay. she worked hard yeah right? but I mean it's she good to grew. encourage them but, she grew yeah so if you grow from you know, it's like American Idol, the show American Idol. Yeah. One of the worst things that can happen to you is just killing it on the yeah, first day. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, Nobody, yeah. you know, they want to see you grow. Well, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So I was not taking people's growth into account. Yeah, sure. Right? I can understand that. So when you're, a, when you're a gatekeeper, you should be looking at, I think, resilience and growth. It's like yeah. if you have a child, right? You're concerned about their, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oh, is there something wrong neurologically? Well, do they actually learn? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, are they improving? You know, that's the question. Um, and so in my case, you know, my reputation was being super hardworking, but yeah. I was coming from so deep a hole. Sure. Right. That, it, you know, that, that, that if you saw my, my relentless, I don't think it's a situation where you can't get there. Your mind, Hakeem, your mind is not capable. Because here's what Art Walker, here's the other thing. There are the people that work closely with you and what they think of you. And some people on the committee who never work closely with you and yeah. see how you think. Yeah. Right. So if all the people who work closely with you see you one way, but then other people say, oh, look at this number. Yeah, I don't yeah, like, yeah. man, I got students working in the community right now that were terrible on paper. Uh -huh. And I, and I, you know, like one, you know, a couple that work at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is yeah. one here in Charlottesville, one in um, New Mexico. Yeah. And, you know, the people called me up like, hey, and I'm like, dude. Forget about their grades. This person is amazing. Yeah. And, they, and they've kicked butt, you know, yeah. in their, in their yeah. work life, right? Yeah. So I was prejudged, man, by certain people. Sure, sure. I, I didn't blame it on race. Yeah, like, it's not to prejudge people. It's just look at numbers yeah. as one way. And, it's, yeah. and, and, and the point is that everyone, you know, stereotypes are just that. And they're meant to be changed. And you're absolutely right. I've known, uh, you, you know, we, we, it, what's, it's not, it's not. You're not an awful person for for having having a prejudgment. You're an awful person if you don't want to ever change that prejudgment exactly. in the face of evidence. Exactly. And that's exactly. and, that, and that's the that's the difference, I think. That's the difference. Uh, let, yeah. Let, I don't want to harp on that too much, but but yeah. I think you know, and and I think you you know I relate to the fact that you know you write in the, in the in the book whenever you did really poorly, mm. it, it was useful for you to know you done really poorly because Absolutely. it was a kick in the pants. Absolutely. Say, hey, I this is a reality check. Hey, yeah. I thought I was cool. I thought I knew it. Yeah. I was. Hey, yeah. I did. I got A's in high school, and there's and, levels and, to know, it. <laughs> and yeah, and and then hey, now I have something to learn. Now other people, when they get a, a poor grade, that's it. That they're, they're done. And so, it, of course, yeah. it depends yeah. on how it, you you got to be realistic with people, but it's still encouraging. And I think you know, you, yeah. Art was clearly both. When Art was disappointed with you, he told you why, but he oh man encouraged you. I mean, there's that episode where you. With, yeah. with, the, with the art, with let the me have of it the, of, of that uh, of, of that rocket, yeah. yeah. When he when yeah. you were it, clearly, it mattered a lot to you that he he was disappointed in you at the time. But oh, he absolutely, was, big time. But he yeah. was one when I when you quote him, however, right? Um, you quote he he talks like he, he dealt with racism much of his academic yeah. life, yeah. And that yeah. was he, a generation or so before you. That's right. And yeah. and and I think things have changed. Um, oh yeah, things absolutely have changed. Things yeah. have changed drastically over the course of my life. Yeah, of right? course, and and mine yeah. too. Yeah, and and yeah. Uh, um, and I feel I felt badly. Interestingly enough, I was surprised though when when he said that people still question his intelligence. They never accept that a black man is their intellectual equal, or you can make an original contribution. I yeah, was man. surprised when he said that because he was a full yeah. professor at Stanford. 
Yeah. Which usually is, again, it's the prejudgment. When someone comes into a room, if they're a full professor at Stanford, you make some assumptions about them. Mm. And I'm surprised that that didn't give him a leg up, at, at, or at least he didn't perceive it as giving him a leg up at the time. Well, you know what? It was really weird because there was two things happening. So it, it, it turns out that the very, you know, graduate students talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? So there was this one guy. He's now a professor at Northwestern. He comes in and he works with this other professor, but he had started working with art first. Yeah. And he comes back to the group. He's like, oh, man, you should have heard what this professor said about art. Now, when I started in this world of physics, right, you know, you get accepted to some university. You go in there and you go and you talk to every professor in the department. Yeah, you have yeah, a meeting with each one of them, right? Yeah. Then you go to Silicon Valley and you go talk to every manager. Mm -hmm. Then you go to this other university for how you talk mm -hmm. to everybody. And you know, at these top tier places, some percentage of those folks, maybe a quarter or a yeah. half, are going to talk trash about their colleagues, yeah, about yeah. how they're not as smart, yeah, how they're, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so the thing about that sort of dynamic is, is that certain groups of people feel like, yeah, it happens to everybody. If you're a white dude, heterosexual, you, uh, your, your father, yeah. your great grandfather, yeah, like, yeah, like Parker yeah. of, of the yeah. Parker Solar Probe. Yeah, people yeah. talk yeah. trash about Parker in solar yeah. physics, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and what he knows, right? The, the living people. And, and, and so my point is, is that if you're like from certain groups, it almost always finds you. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, suppose you'll be like, oh, I was at this one institution and somebody came at me with this craziness. Oh, I'm happy that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. But if you find that the craziness happens to you at every institution, but why is that it? Because that person that wants to do a misdeed is looking for the one they perceive as vulnerable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because you're an outlier, they perceive you as vulnerable. Right now, when people try that with me, they learn quickly. So I have a rep. I've always had a reputation, right? Because yeah. art, just like my dad taught me how to do things properly, yeah. art taught me how to do things properly. Right. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I've I've had to confront. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But and and yeah. you're yeah, and, and all it did was make you more you know more determined and and that that's because oh, yeah, of the absolutely. person you were, which which was from your upbringing, which some people might say you know, the having to deal with the dangers and the street and everything yeah. else would say was a disadvantage actually was an advantage because, an advantage. because yeah. academics can't be anywhere near as scary yeah. as, as, as a dope dealer on the street, no matter and, how hard they try. And, and going back to the beginning, this whole thing about web. Yeah. The thing that was so crazy about this to me is that when I released my article in January, 2021 on web yeah. and my um, colleagues responded, uh -huh. And then they tried to respond by bullying me, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like cyber bullying me. I'm like, you got the wrong guy. You, you got the wrong guy. Well, I want to get the web because I, I do want to, I want, I want to, I don't want <laughs> this to be all about what we're talking about now. Although, yeah, enough, you know, you, you, you did say when, when art presented his first full disc solar images using his oh, yeah. new technology, some celebrated while others challenged the authenticity oh, yeah. of the images and doubts among some of his peers. But I, I think I've seen that every. I mean, that always happens. Let, let me give you, let me tell you what it was. It, you're absolutely right it was. And you know what it was? It was one of these cases, like Einstein with the cosmological constant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know what nature is doing. Yeah. And because the data does not reflect that, there's something Nothing wrong, wrong with, with the with data. data. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I, in and, fact, actually, well, anyway, that, that when I first proposed dark energy in 95, yeah. I proposed it, but I was absolutely certain something was wrong with the data. And um, I, I proposed it. I said basically the data only is is me and Mike Turner. The data only agrees oh, right. with things if 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 there's dark energy. I tried to tell Saul oh, Permian which data was it? wrong. So you know what's interesting? I had a very similar um, conversation with Striker. He's like, yeah. yeah, you know, I predicted dark energy before. It, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you know, they, yeah, Mike and I wrote the paper, and I I really did because my yeah. point was to say, hey. Some of the observers, there must be something wrong because this is so crazy. It's only mm. consists with this. And no one was more surprised than me when it turned out to be exactly what, what we predicted. And, and in fact, as wow. I say, Saul had come when I lectured at Berkeley on that, he said, well, prove yeah. me wrong and then didn't. But it was it was mostly because wow. I assumed the data, the, the data had to be wrong. And it was shocking to, right. to see it right. But yeah. anyway. And that's um, and by the way, that's the internal story in Berkeley and how Reese published before Saul. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah right. uh, <laughs> I was around during it all. I was trying to convince everyone. Oh, yeah. I was going around giving colloquia saying there's this dark energy and at Caltech and Berkeley and and I and I remember I spent a term I spent the summer there at LBL yeah. and 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 everyone just politely smiled. This was between 95 and 97 and, oh, and later yeah. on when in 98 when they discovered it it was I mean it was uh, it was satisfying but it was interesting to to see how um 
but you know, I understood myself because I didn't believe it. I proposed mm. it, but I thought it was right. really so ridiculous mm. that that it it had to be because some it of the experiments were wrong. Yeah. Now, let me. I want to get to the science in a second. But there's one thing I want to ask you. I can't help it. Um, yeah. I still have to understand this, and and you can help me. Um, uh, and I know it's it, it, maybe it's just uh, well, I don't know if it's an editorial decision, and I've seen it mm. in a variety of publications. Mm. Um, so black is is capitalized everywhere, and white isn't. I know that's yeah. a trend, and I wondered. I, I yeah. got to ask why, because I, I yeah, you know, we we asked the publisher that, right? Yeah. So it's, it's funny because Josh did that to me. He he says he's like Hakeem, why are you capitalizing black? but not the W and white. And yeah. I was like, that's how I've always seen it. Yeah, right? I know. And yeah. I've always seen it. I'm yeah. wondering what the argument is. And so it goes to the publisher yeah. and we write a specific little paragraph like, yeah, you know, what, what is the story here? Yeah. And the publisher is like, yeah, that's the way it's done. Black is capitalized. W is it. So it, it's sort of one of those things like the, it's uh, accepted. It's, it's just the uh, story, the lottery. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I just don't think I am um, the way it is. Yeah. And well, I, I think because, point. I understand I think, what was probably the point of it at one point, but I just think here's think the question. Was, would yeah. you, would you, would you capitalize a word like Caucasian? Is that capitalized? Uh, I think, yeah, because it's a label. I think it's a, uh, so I, I think that the reason why is because black you know, there was no, you know, Negro fell out of favor. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, yeah. African American is a is a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And so whites don't, you know, your race, and and, it is, and it's really interesting because I think when you say black, you really mean African American. Generally, you don't, you don't, well, you don't do. mean. Although, you know, I tried because, to get a, a, a someone uh, a job in my when I was chair who was who was black, but he yeah. wasn't African American, and and what he amazed was, me was the yeah. rules were so ridiculous. Yeah. He was really good. He's a good physicist from from yeah. Urbana that I couldn't get him in because he wasn't minority. And I thought, oh, what, the, what, what are you anyway? Yeah, 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 yeah. he yeah. was from Barbados. Well, I mean, you something. know, if you if you're from like the, the, I I'll, I tell my friends, you know, so I have like I said all over the the gamut. And, you know, I have friends that are very Afrocentric, you know. And mm -hmm. since I've been all over Africa, yeah, of course, I and they will say black. Great jobs working with South. I mean, the end of your book oh, yeah. talking working with yeah. the South African kids is yeah. really for me among the most heartwarming part of it. In the oh, last part of your book, where you yeah. you see them succeed and. Yeah. And, I, and I and I and I just admire what you did there so much. I just have to thank you, thank you. Well, but the point is, is that I tell my friends, like, look, man, I've been all over Africa. I can't find Blackistan nowhere yeah. because people have actual identities. They have actual. I'm an Ebo. I'm a Luo. I'm a yeah. Luya. I'm a Kissy. I'm a Zulu. You know, and 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 you take that from them. You know, if, if you're French or if you're Irish or if you're German, and then you come to an American and you're white, like you know. I've been all over Europe. There's no Whiteland in Europe. You know, you, you have a, you know, but, but here's the thing, man. I think that, you know, and I didn't think this in my youth, but we're freaking Americans and that's, you yeah. know, we're all in this together uh -huh. and, you know, we, we, whatever your recent ingredients are, cause you know, we think of them as our origins, but they're yeah. really our ingredients. Yeah, Nobody's, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, we're all worms, right? Yeah. yeah a we're worm all that fish. became a we're, fish. We're all, all of that. Yeah. And, and that we're became also, a tetrapod, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we're also probably at some very basic level, all black and all white, but anyway. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, especially as a mixed up person like myself. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, the, but the thing is, man, is that, you know, I, I think that give, you know, having this, I have a representative sample of the planet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. having been all over the damn yeah. place. Yeah. And, and I think that what's going on in the U S is really special. And it's somewhat miraculous and it needs to be preserved and it needs to be protected. Uh, this pluralistic, peaceful society that is prosperous, you know, it, it, it's not to be taken for granted. And, yeah. you know, we think our think infrastructure. It's as exceptional as you think it is. Most Americans do. I mean, I grew up in Canada, having lived in a few different countries. You know, I just yeah, I, 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 have you been to the developing world? Yeah, I mean, I've been to the developing family. world. No, I know. Yeah. It's look, I'm lucky. I, I'm accident. Uh, every day, the accident of my genes is lucky. I mean, the, the accident of my circumstances. Yeah, I could have been born, yeah. you know, uh, in so Look, many places in the world where I wouldn't have had a chance. Maybe you can ap appreciate this. I tell my 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 friends, I'm like, listen, man, America is so, and the same of Canada, is so prosperous. Our houses just sit out in the open. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, because yeah. yeah. in most places, right, you're either in the slums or behind a wall yeah. that has razor wire and spikes, right. You know, yeah, and, and, no, no, I know it's there's yeah, all, well, yeah. not most, but a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, we just ha we have to be thankful, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, I think, I think a lot of this sense 
I hadn't planned to go here, but I'll tell it. it yeah. A lot of this ridiculous sense of victimization that we're seeing yeah. people, this identity politics yeah. is people ha not having enough to complain about. I mean, it's, it, 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 you know, if, if there were, if they, yeah, oh, I've been excited problems, because right? of this one little thing, but you go to most countries, my God, you'd be killed or what, you know, it's, yeah, man. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's tough. It's, well, you know, I think the other reason why there's a lot of victimization mm -hmm. that, takes the character that it does. There was a book I was reading several years ago. I forget which one it was, but it gave the statistic. When you have concentrated, um, tough living situations, mm -hmm. so minorities, you know, if, if, it was something like if you are of this particular race and you're below this particular income level, what's the probability of your neighbors yeah, yeah. being in the same, yeah, 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 you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, demographic vote? Mm -hmm. And so for minorities, it was much higher than for a white person. So when you concentrate the sort of, um, you know, the school issues, the, the the issues earning money, the issues with violence and crime. And because, you know, it's not when, when you live in the hood, it's also a Gaussian. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. It is and most everywhere. people are just, you know, you go to any hood in the morning and you're going to see a train of people going to do their minimum wage jobs. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But. The cats that you see publicly out on the street are the ones that are the really ends of the Gaussian. Yeah. Are the ones that people. Yeah, just like on social media, you see the you That's see right. the the noisy it, exactly. asses and 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 they're the ones exactly that, and they get and that's the unfortunate thing about right right now is a gift and really good people are virtually they would, before they no they never you know you wouldn't you yeah. could ignore them and now yeah. Yeah. we still should ignore them but they end up getting a voice that they didn't have before. Yeah, man. Let me, Twitter is that. <laughs> let, let me ask you two other things. Um, yeah. Uh, in this regard, and then I want to, as I say, I promise I want to move first to science and then to yeah. the web. Um, the well, let, let me ask. It's yeah, just it's because of the timing. This I don't know when this will appear, but it's yeah. it's it's honest to say that yesterday affirmative action was what the Supreme Court. Uh, um, you know, ended up in principle. And I, I think in practice, right. it won't. In academia. Won't. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. But we, I think my own feeling is the universities will get around it one way or another. But, right, but, right. um, and I've, I have to say, I have mixed feelings about affirmative action. Mm. I, I, and, and namely in the sense that I think if I think of, of your case, and I want to present it to you, frankly and honestly, because I think we can do that. And some people may be shocked that I'm saying some of these things, but I don't really care. Um, yeah. They, so you, you went to Tougaloo. Yeah. And it was a great, it was a great place for you and some, because you were Absolutely. able to excel there. Yeah. Okay. And if you had, let's say if you had somehow be, been aware, and this is the big problem, you didn't even know your point is, was you said it somewhere when you went to the Navy, you didn't even know about college or how to get in. And I, I, I right. think that's part of the problem. I, I used to go into inner city schools in Cleveland. My, my wife at the time worked, volunteered in them. And I talked to these kids about, the world, you know, I tell them that Lake Erie was right. They didn't even know they were two miles from the lake, much less anything else. But, but I talk about being a scientist. They had no idea. I mean, it was right. just a different universe, and they didn't see there yep. was any way to go from here to there. They just didn't know how. And and you literally didn't yeah. know how either. And absolutely and, and, did not had but, no idea it existed. Yeah, exactly. And you were lucky <laughs> enough that some people somehow showed those options to you. But had you gone to Stanford as an undergraduate instead as a graduate student, you would have you would have just <laughs> crashed and burned. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so it's, I think but it's, that's me. Yeah. Well, don't well, extrapolate always, me to everyone no, else. But there are always tales yeah. or people are going to succeed no yeah. matter what. There are people who aren't. The, the question really is one of whether when it comes to tertiary education, uh, what, look, there, there are inequities in our society that I am I'm aware of as much as you. And I become more yeah. aware of when I read books like yours mm -hmm. and others. Um, but, are we going to solve it by at that uh, at that stage in a person? Shouldn't we not be spending more if we're interested in affirmative action? Should we not be spending more money making sure young kids get the opportunities and knowledge so, so that they know how, what the options are for them in life and some education and have good books in their schools and have teachers that encourage them and environments that encourage them? It seems to me that's the ultimate only. That's way a out of this big point. ask. I know that's it's a, a big ask, but it's the ultimate. <laughs> 
But it's how are you going to construct that? I mean, it, we haven't done it so far. But but does affirmative action solve the problem? At, at well, I, I, I'm not going to. So, I, I, look, so I'm I have very little. To, I'm, I'm being the no, devil's no, no. advocate. I'm not here. scared. I'm, listen, I ain't scared, Lawrence. No, I know, and I, I'm not scared of asking. Let me let me call me let me go there with you. Let me go there with you because you know I look at it like this. Okay, so again. You and I, you know, you know how it is. Good people are hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. And I have had to hire lots of people. You know, my group was typically, you know, you know, 15 yeah. students at a time, right? Undergrads, yeah. graduate students. Yeah. And there were these cats who would come to me, like some of the people I mentioned to you at the NRAO. Mm -hmm. They're basically C students. Now, if I, the one person, for example, I had met him because he was in nanotechnology lab. Dude mm -hmm. came across brilliant as hell. He came across focus. He came across, and that's exactly what he was. Yeah. But if you looked at his transcript, it didn't reflect it that didn't at reflect all. It didn't reflect it, yeah, okay. Yeah, so if I am a gatekeeper, and so that's what we're talking about, affirmative it's action, really, about it's being really a gatekeeper. gatekeepers, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm looking at identifying talent. Mm -hmm. What am I basing it on? Am I basing it slowly, solely on grades and test scores? Now, I'll tell you this. I have been around the block enough to know that, you know, I always wondered myself, oh, why is it black? Because when I got to Stanford for the first time in my life, the black folks around me were not other poor black folks. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right? And I was like, that's they're the different. Yeah, that's the point. So they're, they're different. They're, you said it. There was a different from you. You joined the sorority or whatever, or fraternity, yeah, and they were yeah. different from you as anyone else, right? Yeah, exactly. And and so I'm just like, yo, you know, what about us back home in Mississippi? Yeah. And, and right. And, and so I think there's two things. I also think that there's something you want for the health of your society. Mm -hmm. And and that is, for example, here in America, sometimes, you know, you hear conservatives talk about the uh, attacking the, 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 the safety net, the societal safety net, yeah, yeah. the free money safety net, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what our ancestors in America had to deal with is something that modern Americans have not had to deal with, but we're starting to get there. And that is slums. Yeah. Right? You're in Johannesburg, South Africa, just because you live in the upper middle class place, you're not safe when you have slums. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're not going to be able to live without a wall around your house. You're yeah. getting carjacked in your own driveway. Yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that safety net, you might think is free money, but what it's doing is it's protecting you from slums, mm -hmm. at which point none of us are safe. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so I, 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 man, I forgot the question. What was it? Oh, it was about, <laughs> it was about affirmative okay, I action. I like what you said, but I remember yeah, the question. No, okay. It was about affirmative action. So here's the point though, right? So take a guy like me. In my community, in rural Mississippi where I live, mm -hmm. going to college, people only did that to be teachers and it yeah. rarely happened. It rarely right? happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a niece. I'll tell you the story of my niece, Monique. So I'm going to tell you about the impact of, you know, how... It is that you can make an investment mm -hmm. that is is pays off bigger than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So my niece, when she was a sophomore in high school, I started encouraging her to attend college because I saw how my life was transformed by my Stanford education. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't hearing me, man. She was like, no, I don't like school. I want to go to work. And because we're in rural America, the job that she could get was working at the chicken plant. Okay. Right. So after three years of working at the chicken plant, she announces to me that she's now going to go to college. Okay. So I go home for the holidays. This other family comes over and they bring up the topic of how they're trying to encourage their younger family member to go to college. Mm -hmm. So to poke fun at Monique, I said, hey, just get him a job at the chicken plant. That chicken <laughs> plant got Monique to go to college. And Monique with her little attitude goes, that ain't why I'm going. And I'm like, <laughs> Really, why are you going? And she goes, you. I see your life, and that's what I want. Oh. Now, Monique has a master's degree in education. She's uh -huh. an assistant principal. She's a leader in education. Uh -huh. And people started going to college from that community because no one had ever seen anyone do it and yeah. knew what was on the other side of that. Y and yeah. even though you see other people do it, you feel like you're so different from them. Like, when yeah. I went to when I started college thinking about becoming a medical doctor, seemed to me like becoming president. Yeah, now yeah. that I've been through the education system, I'm like, oh, it's super easy to become a medical doctor, right? <laughs> Way easier to get a PhD in physics. But the average person doesn't see it that way, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You, you just don't know. You know, and just like, for example, as a, as a super educated PhD scientist, mm -hmm. and I looked at the mathematics I do every day that involves numbers, and I'm like, wait a minute, all I ever do is add, subtract, and multiply <laughs> the single digit numbers. That's, you know, what is all this other stuff? You know, it's, it's, it's you know. <laughs> Well, you know, but I think your your point is right that it's nice. Uh, look, I get the point. I think it's important for people to see 
the possibility in themselves and, 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 and therefore giving some people a leg up, especially those who can succeed is great. Um, is, is a good example for others, but one could also say, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm to some yeah. extent taking the devil's advocate position here, not entirely because I have issues. I think my, the, what you said earlier actually really resonates with, with my thinking, which is, Hey, what we really got to do is treat people as individuals and yeah. try and look beyond the transcripts, beyond things. But but that yeah. doesn't mean labeling them by race or by whatever else. Is to see what is to is to really look at them enough to say yeah. what have they overcome, what what are they really good in, and what are the op- options. And so, in yeah. in that sense, I kind of agree with the Supreme Court that having one box that somehow gives you a leg up isn't the same because exactly what you said, the black kids who were at Stanford already had 10 legs up uh, but before, yeah. <laughs> before they got to Stanford, most yeah, of them. Yeah. And they, they didn't, yeah. you know, so what you want to do is give kids like you who may not, well, actually you look good on paper or, or because you did well at, at Tougaloo, but, but I mean, kids or like the kids you were talking about who were really intelligent and hardworking, but it may not be reflected in a transcript or other things. You want to look at those other characteristics and schools are going to end up doing that, which is they're going to start giving more emphasis to trying to see the life story. And for me, the affirmative action should be to find people who, who for one reason or another have had to overcome adversity, Yeah, you know, and race isn't the only for everyone, not for everyone is race and adversity. There are other adversities. And for some people, race is an adversity, but take it on an individual level. It would, rather it would than be great. Rather than it would be great if we could, but you know, every, there are so many biases everywhere yeah, within right. human minds that it's hard, you know, even though we come up with these ideals, it's, it's hard to really implement them in, in real life. So I guess what people were saying with affirmative action is, is like, okay, even though we're trying to be objective about it, we still like, 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 you know, I'll give you another example. Uh-huh. At the end of graduate school, you know, I had a NASA GSRP fellowship. It yeah. ended and I was still in graduate school. Okay. So I started teaching Kaplan MCAT. Okay. All right. Okay. And man, I it was so eye-opening. I was like, damn, back at Tougaloo, we all just went and took these tests. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was no way someone could just walking in could compete against my students. I taught MCAT physics. Yeah. My students were they were maxing the physics on MCAT, right? Yeah, exactly. Because I remember I, when I was, I grew up in Canada and I took the graduate entrance exam. I didn't, I walked in, I'd never heard of it before. And then yeah. I learned that they're, you know, now I realize their kids taking classes in it in advance yeah. to do it. Yeah. And so what you, what, what's going to happen is, is that if you base it on test scores, if you base it on yeah. grades, like, like another example, my son, right? I have a son, you know, I homeschooled a kid till he was 10. But, you know, his sister is in large part responsible for him learning to read. Yeah. All right. And this kid could read like an adult when he was three and a half. All right. Oh. Mm-hmm. So my mom says to me when he was very young, you know, I think he's smarter than you are. And I was <laughs> like, no, the hell he ain't. His daddy got a PhD in physics. Neither one of my parents graduated high school. It makes a difference. Yeah. It's you know. like you want to send your kids to the best school. Yeah. Having parents who are educated in what schools care about. Like, like give me, don't get me wrong, right? We're all yeah. educated by our parents and yeah, yeah. what they That's have to that. offer. Mm-hmm. But not, not many of them have what's going to get you into Harvard to offer, yeah, yeah, right? But yeah. if they came from Harvard, they definitely do have it to offer, <laughs> right? Well, so I, some of them, or some of them's parents were gave a lot of money, but you never know. I get <laughs> That's true, too. I get to I get to Stanford. Three guys in my research group, their fathers were PhD physicists. I knew One they wrote third. about it in the book, and I knew yeah. and I knew some of their fathers. I rented a house uh, from Bill Willis once when I was in Oh, no way. You know, anyway, Bill, so anyway, anyway, I got so. re- I got in contact with Tom Willis again. We, we yeah. talked, like, back during the pandemic. It made yeah. me feel old when I read your book because I, I knew the parents that you were talking oh, about. Oh, man, that is wild. So yeah. did you know uh, Max Allen's father? Because he's from, uh, I think he was at McGill. Yeah, yeah, you know, Canada's big country. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it ain't. It's a big, geographically, it's a sliver. <laughs> Yeah, the sliver, of it's true. But you like Canadians early on. I read that. But anyway, <laughs> still um, love Canadians, man. I work with these um, Toronto production companies. Yeah, it's a blast yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah it is. It's it, yeah. It has its. It has anyway. It has advantage. I've now sampled both back and forth, and there's yeah, advantages yeah. and disadvantages. Yeah, I love both exactly. And and yeah. you said something when you're talking about about your son and 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 education. And I was gonna. I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I lost that train of thought now. But I oh, think. Man. Um. Yeah. But the bottom line is, oh yeah, look. I when I was at Yale, when I taught at Yale, I yeah. um I never got involved in undergraduate missions, thank God. But uh, yeah. but I taught students, and I thought 
Uh, these Yale students aren't any different than, I mean, the mean, it's a distribution. The difference yeah, was the, the tail of the distribution was really long. But wow. the middle ones I taught, you know, they were, I remember teaching them when we were football players. They stuck to me. They could have been football players anywhere. I don't know how they got into Yale. Y- Yale got a football team? Anyway. Yeah, yeah, probably. And, and uh, uh, what I liked about being at MIT is they didn't. But um, anyway, the, the, I always said when it came to even graduate school, you know, people, I was on some selection committees there and, you know, there are transcripts and there are these tests. And I always basically said, you know, I think we could just throw all the applications down the stairs and take the ones that fell to the bottom. We'd end up getting, you know, the, the ability to know in advance who's going to, who's going to succeed. It wasn't, right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very dubious about all of these yeah. detailed selections, but nevertheless, I think, I think the whole approach you. of trying to look at each kid and realizing that adversity isn't you can't i'm so much against identity politics you can't say in advance on the base necessarily on the basis of someone's race their religion or sometimes even even their economic level or economic level yeah. probably a better determiner you can't really say whether to what extent they've suffered well, they they've had to overcome things or benefited from things but one thing that i want to ask you before and then we're going to leave i promise is some people say oh, look you chose a black advisor um mm-hmm. And, um, and you, and the book in the, in the way you describe it, you chose it because you were really turned on by what he was doing, mm. not because he was black. Mm. Um, is that true? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to unpack, un- disentangle. Of course it thing. is. It's hard to know in advance. Because here, here's the thing that happened. And, and I talked about this in the book as well. After doing my summer research programs, I met a lot of disgruntled, about to graduate graduate students. Yeah, yeah. And they right. armed me with these questions to ask the people. Now, here's the other thing about this. There is diversity in the diversity. Yeah. All right? Mm-hmm. I had never met a black dude like Art Walker before. Yeah, sure. At that age, he, I would have called him what I have been called, <laughs> which White. is whitewash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? I think right. you said in the book you thought he was whitewash. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So I wasn't like, oh, he's my man, yeah, right? Yeah. It wasn't like that at all. Yeah. But when I hit him with those questions, dude, this dude came across so sincere, mm-hmm. you know, and he came across like he really did care about, because that's what they were saying. Make sure your advisor that you choose cares about humans and you. Yeah, and absolutely. Being, right? That's a great thing yeah. to tell students, because I've, yeah. I've met so many advisors who don't, and I yeah. tried to be an yeah. advisor who does. But, yeah, uh, and, and and he nailed that man. And then I then I challenged him. I was like, "Oh yeah, well, what are your students doing now?" Yeah, yeah. And he started with Hal Tompkins at Slack, and then he goes, "And you may have heard of my other student, Sally Ride. She's yeah, yeah. American." Yeah, I remember, like, okay. I'd say the book too. Yeah, that's all he had to say for you. And then you, you, you <laughs> like, okay, he won you over right that. No, I'm like, but the then man, when he showed those solar photographs and that, yeah, that graduate that, research class, that dude. that that's yeah. Then you Ooh. clearly captured you. No, that's you. you it was the photo, and I want to get to the solar photographs in a second. Yeah. The, the yeah. reason I'm saying is that some people say their big problem is is they don't see people that look like themselves, and therefore they can't, and that's a big impediment to going ahead and doing things. And I can understand it to some extent, except I never saw people that look to me. I always still felt like an outsider and to free Frank. Yeah. My, so, and my supervisor was a black PhD graduate from Stanford. Okay. Yeah. Who? So, uh, Roscoe Giles was his name. Yeah, dude. I'm, 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 I've been talking to Roscoe all month. Yeah. Okay. Roscoe is, oh. Ro- and I chose Roscoe not because, uh, it, no you way. know, he looked like me because uh, he didn't, but because he was yeah. really nice and really smart. Exactly. Really, and he, yeah, and yeah, he yeah. also said, I was the kind of guy who had to work on what I was interested in, what, what, what yeah. someone else was working, and right. and he did all of that, and he was a wonderful man, and I didn't need so f- yeah. see, I guess I'm is. just one of the different I am, and then others because for me, I could have yeah. cared what someone looked like so, or where so their background was. Let me ask you directly, man. Yeah. So so you know, some people are gonna hate me for saying this, but I noticed this when I was at Tougaloo because we would go to these yeah. summer research programs. Yeah, and I um I said uh you know the students come back from the summer song be like, oh, I went to this program. I was the only black student there. It was horrible. <laughs> and I always joke, because I'd be like, yeah, I was the only student there, black student there. It was great, right? <laughs> Not because I was the only black student there. Like, yeah. I'll give you an example. My very first summer research program, I'm going to admit this, man, you know, it's in the book. I was a big pothead, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I beat these white dudes at University of Georgia, and the next week they get busted for selling pot. <laughs> <laughs> but they're right back the next day. Yeah. But these guys were like, oh, man, You've never done psychedelics, and I hadn't, did not that yeah. summer. 
you 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 don't know Pink Floyd, you don't know Led Zeppelin, and they mm-hmm. want to teach me, you know, and every day yeah. I'm like hanging out with these dudes, right? Yeah. I'm also hanging out with my frat brothers. Yeah. I'm also going to play basketball. Yeah. I go to the University of Arizona, right? That summer. Same thing. White dude takes me, you know, rock climbing in, in Oak Creek Canyon and yeah. you know, and all this kind of jazz. Um, and so I've always been a very curious person mm-hmm. and I always like newness, right? Yeah, I always yeah. like people of different cultures. Yeah, so sure. when I show up at Berkeley in the summer of ninety one. You know, I'm very open about, I don't know this. I don't know that, you know, so I don't know if you know um, Rebecca Bernstein at Carnegie Observatories. Uh So her and her Princeton classmate and this guy from Haverford uh, were like, oh, man, we're going to show you everything. Never had Thai food. Here's Thai food. Never had an artichoke. Here's an artichoke. Never had Indian food. Here's Indian food. And I was loving it. And and by the way, we're all Jewish. How come you didn't know based on our names? I'm like, I didn't know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, you know. I understand, you know, reading about humans that people come in a couple of types. There are those of us that love newness and there there are those of us that hate newness. They want everything to be the same and and that kind of thing. Right. So just like there are people like I don't understand who are like, oh, this person was not speaking English in public. I'm angry Mm -hmm. at them. I don't understand that. Right. Once I was saying. Yeah. But I guess the question I'm asking is how important. And and I'm really asking. Well, here's where it is important. Mm -hmm. It's not important necessarily for inspiring you into the field. Mm-hmm. Most of the black astronomers and astrophysicists I know and f- physicists, they weren't inspired by a black physicist per mm-hmm. se. They were inspired okay. by the universe or yeah, Einstein yeah, or somebody yeah. like that, okay. right? Mm-hmm. But where it does matter is in mentoring, right? That's so what I'm wondering. Fact, you got yeah. mentored. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. So the, so the way that art told me how, taught me how to handle things, like I've had great mentors, like Michael mm-hmm. Levy and Natalie Rowe at Berkeley, right? We're mentors. What well, they taught had great me mentors in high school that were also... Oh mentors. yeah, yeah, Mr. And they Cross, were white white Mr. teacher. Barber. They were great mentors. Oh yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Reeves, right? Yeah. Our one white teacher. But yeah. but, and, but, and when, but yeah, exactly. And, and so you know, most of my adult, most of my uh, mentors this century have been white women, actually, mm-hmm. right? And because yeah. a lot of it has been in media. Yeah. But and and to the extent that I have decided to like, oh, okay, I want to do something in another field. Let me go find this Croatian dude. I think he's Croatian, mm-hmm. Joko Ivesic. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I'm interested in. Um, continue this project. Who's the best at it? Oh, Josh Bloom and Joey Richards. You know, mm-hmm. let me go work with them. Yeah. Oh, now I'm interested in this. Oh yeah. Dave McCamus, McComas at, at Princeton. Yeah. So I, for me, it's like, I'm interested in a topic and I'm looking for a cool person to work with. I'm not looking for a black person to work with. I'm looking for a cool, cool person, person to work with. Yeah. But at the same time, because I am a black dude, I'm like, yo, Stefan Alexander, let's write a paper together, homie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just like I deal with my friend David Santiago, just like yeah. I deal with my friend Nisha Turner. We're like yeah. friends, we're like, hey, let's write papers together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, Lawrence, let's write a paper yeah. together, man. Yeah. But, you know, and, and so I think, though, for understanding the type of challenges that you're going to have, and how people perceive you, you do have to operate in a certain way, right? And so um, art taught me, so I'll give an example. At, in, at Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. after I left Stanford, I got challenged. Here I am. One day, this, this guy, Korean dude, Nam Hun Kim, not Nam Hun Kim, Hyok, Wo Kyung, whatever, Kim. Yeah. He says, Hakeem, come here. I was terrorizing this dude already. He was really serious. <laughs> business company. He said, let me tell you something, man. I've been in this company for many years. I'm one of two black PhDs mm-hmm. in applied materials that had 3,000 PhDs out of 22,000 total employees worldwide, okay. right? Okay. One of two black PhDs. He said, let me tell you something. Something, he said, well, here's how he said it. I've been at this company for a very long time, 15 years. I've seen a lot of things and I've heard a lot of things. And there are certain things I wish I hadn't seen and he- heard. And I've heard something about you. And what I want to let you know is, is that if you're a member of certain groups, you get to hear certain things. And if you and if you're not, you don't. And he was talking about being a Korean guy. He uh-huh. said something is about to happen to you and it is about to happen to you because you are black. If I were you, I would go get an attorney right now. Now, let me tell you how I've always operated. Mm-hmm. Unless someone stands up in a crowded room and starts yelling racial expletives uh-huh. at me, uh-huh. I'm not bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because yeah. I don't see it working out in my favor. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when he says that to me, I'm like, whoa, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't want no parts of it. And it unfolded exactly as he said it did. Mm-hmm. It was going to. But because I had Art Walker's training mm-hmm. in how to handle certain types of injustices, I was already prepared and I survived that particular event. Mm-hmm. Another thing that happened while I was working at Applied Materials, I get a call from the EEOC, uh, 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 an attorney in Washington, D.C. 
And he says, listen, we have received strong evidence that you have been discriminated against in hiring. So here's what happened. I went to the Stanford Career Fair. I gave out my CV to various companies. Mm -hmm. And one of these Silicon Valley companies, north of Stanford, not south, like Applied Materials was, apparently I went in, they were evaluating and somebody in the room felt like I was being discriminated against because of my race and they reported it, right? Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it. So again, I'm like, dude, I don't know anything about this. I yeah. can't say anything about yeah. it, right? So this is in a way for me, hearsay, mm -hmm. right? It's not, you know, I don't know when people have come at me, I don't assume they're motivated by anything other than what I can directly observe they're being motivated Smart by. attitude. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I still have to handle this situation. Yeah. And I get it. White dudes got to handle the situation too. Women mm -hmm. got to, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's a, it's a tough mm -hmm. world out here, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I, my attitude has always been, so what? But here's the thing, man. I used to have two ways of dealing with problems. Mm -hmm. Right before I met our Walker, moping and punching you in the face. <laughs> right, no, two. So I needed that training. Yeah, and... you needed something in between those two. That's not good. Yeah. In between those, right? But didn't that, the question? I, you know, I'm gonna keep pushing. Yeah. He was yeah. a great mentor. But, yeah. But I like to think if I'd been your professor, I might have been able to give you that training too. You know what? It it it, it, it really depends. It really mm -hmm. really depends. Maybe you would have, but maybe you would not even known. Yeah. Yeah. No to approach me and let me know certain things in certain ways, right? Like, like mm -hmm. I anticipate you're going to need this. So let me show you how to do it the right yeah, way. Yeah, maybe. Right? You know, that's why I'm trying to figure this. I'm trying to, yeah. I found it eye opening to read your story because I, you know, yeah. I've had perceptions I've uh, of academia that I've seen. And, and it's, yes. and I mean, it's, it, it it's, it's, it's competitive and there's assholes and there's yeah. cowardice and there's all the rest. But at Absolutely. the same time, it's also more one of the more welcoming, enlightening environments. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's what, and when I hear it talked about as if it's just like, you know, but here's I, the I, thing though, man, it's that whole vulnerability trigger. Yeah. Yeah. When you're, when you're the vulnerable, when there's someone looking to make, you know, like a new right. manager comes and they want yeah. to make an example, they're going right for the vulnerable. Oh, yeah. Part. And I've been at the bun end of that. And I probably, yeah. for all I know, I've been at the other end too. And when I was yeah. in the heart, I try never to be, but, but, uh, well, look, let's, I'm just going to close okay. the door here one second. I'm like Fat Joe. Y'all talk that stuff. I want that beef. <laughs> what, was, what was that? There's a uh, line in, uh, you know, there's this DJ Khaled song called uh -huh. Over uh -huh. with all these rappers, you know, Lil Wayne. And yeah. one of them is Fat Joe. And he said, y'all talk that ish. I want that beef. <laughs> right? I, hey, I love, you know, bring me the beef. I'll suited to sleep but <laughs> okay. i enjoyed the fight but not you know <laughs> okay no this is okay no this is great and I, i'm glad we had that this particular frank conversation about this because i think it, yeah. it's kind of thing most people would never yeah know, man people talk are about i think and and, and, and um yeah. you know and it's it's just not black or white and it's interesting for me it's to not. have seen my attitude towards the affirmative action decision is different now than it would have been a few years ago as i've watched uh yeah. people and but the key thing that are told you, and this is a great segue that taught you. This uh, is is you. It's you say near the end of the book. Art, art taught me the the difference between what I believe to be true and what I know as a scientist mm. to be true. Absolutely, that's the final measure of a researcher to be able mm -hmm. to challenge one's own beliefs and prejudices. Let evidence tell the story. Absolutely. And I, for me, that's one of the most important lines in the book. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. certainly what I. I mean, I spend most of my life trying to convince people of is that that's the mm. heart of science and it's the nature of science. And, it, and if he taught you that, that's what really turned you into scientists. Forget the mentoring and all the rest of the stuff. This, you know, that's to get along with people. He taught you how to get along with people and that's okay. And, and it's a secret, but scientists are actually people. But, but, <laughs> uh, but the really important thing, that's just, that's just window dressing. The really important thing to be a scientist is that sentence. And yeah. that's the nature of science. So what, so I want to talk to you about the Nate, because I think all of this is also relevant to web. We're going to get to it. Right. The, absolutely. When I read this, it indicates to me your approach to James Webb was yeah. that of a scientist, absolutely. which is to say the difference between what I believe to be true and what I know to be true and, and, and to be, you know, challenged. Dude, when I, don't go further than that. I don't do believe. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I, when people say, what do you believe? I say, Belief isn't the right. No scientist should say the yeah. word belief. Things Ever. are likely or unlikely, and you can hear the yeah, reasons exactly. why, and hear the reasons why. And yeah, we'll get there. But that, that's all. What I when anyone yeah. says belief, and by the way, 
who, I hate they, when they ask a politician that. What do you do? You believe? Who cares what you believe? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, yeah. and people say, do you believe in this? It's just not the right word for science. And no. although I will say one of the things I didn't cover, I was really amused by your sm- short career as a preacher. Oh which I, man, which, which I, which I, but and 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 um, uh, did you ever come out? By the way, to the community as not as not uh, you know because I've been with a lot of clergy. There's a there's a yeah. clergy project. I've yeah. talked to a lot of clergy people who yeah. have their jobs and they don't believe, but they know they're trapped, right? They can't, right, they right, can't come right. out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I saw that you were, you were doing a great job preaching, but there was one problem you didn't believe. It reminded yeah. me a lot right. of the clergy people. Man, I talked to. It really, especially with, you know, in, in the book where I talk about my wife, mm-hmm. you know, I get married, her dad was a hardcore yeah. believer, man. Yeah. And I would, you know, in your youth, you know, you have these, discussions about religions and politics and what's true and what's not. So yeah, I did that back then. So in a way I did come out, you know, and I did. It, it, you you know, never came out to the community that you preached to, I assume, right? Well, I wouldn't in be, a way I, I was I always asking, it, but, but well, here, here's the, here's the point it is how you define coming out to them. Right. Uh-huh. So on the one hand, it was a situation where, you know, I, I knew that I didn't know. And so in high school, I would have more been described as more agnostic yeah. than anything. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. like, okay, this, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And so it's not until I really did the deep dive into yeah. history and knowledge and everything in graduate school. And I was like, okay, here's now how I understand the world. Here is how I understand the world of spirituality and humans and their interface with it. Here's how I understand the physical world, you know, and, and, and came to a place though where, you know, I'm more forgiving of people, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and the variation and diversity of belief and ideas and this sort of thing. I just want us to be well behaved. I don't want us killing each other. Right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I also would like us to be able to tell what's real and what's not real. So I've often said, if you've known me, like one of my biggest fears is going before a jury of 12 of my peers. Yeah, yeah. So I know how I, the transformation I went through yeah. to learn rigor and what it is to know, you know, and then I'm like, man, you know, had I not gone through that, I was accepting things as, as true that I did not know to be true. Yeah, yeah, and, you yeah know. no, I agree. I mean, when you look at what people, <laughs> eyewitness testimony, and I've seen them, and, oh, and, and, and her yeah. state testimony, well, I've seen it, and I've, I've seen it, and I've been at various ends of it, and it's really, yeah. it's really scary. But, the, yeah. but, but, so what turned you, so, so let's talk about the science. Yeah. He taught yeah. you to, what did you, what did you, In your science, what did you most yeah. challenge your prejudice? What was the most surprising result as a solar physicist? Dude, when your damn models matched actual reality. Yeah. That's, the, yeah. that's, that's why I, the same way it was with me with dark energy. I couldn't believe it when it was right. Yeah, man. You know, you get this data that you can barely analyze, right? You build some model that's kind yeah. of like a toy model. Yeah. And you put them one next to the other and say, oh, this thing we can't see it's more than likely this. Yeah. And then somebody makes an actual measurement and it turns out to be that, right? So I'll give you two good examples really early on that turned out to be true. So one thing is, is that if you look at the sun, you know, there's the the, the nascent slow speed solar wind at 400 uh, kilometers per second. There's a high speed solar wind that comes out of coronal holes at 800. Mm-hmm. And you see these ray-like structures coming out that look like, oh, that must be what's flowing. They're called polar plumes mm-hmm. out of there. They must be the source of high speed solar wind. We do our analysis, find out, oh, no, actually, they're not. We published that in 1997. The Sumer spectrograph on a Soho spacecraft that mm-hmm. measures the flows mm-hmm. of these damn things a few years y- later, and they match exactly. But nobody cites that paper, even though we did it first, probably yeah, like your yeah, dark I energy. Like. Okay. Then I, I say, okay, what is the nature of, because remember when I told you, People didn't believe art's data. One thing they didn't believe was that, you know, the higher energy X-ray uh, images that existed before that, you only saw this emission of the corona in what are called active regions, right? Mm-hmm. But now here, he presents this data at 171 angstroms, you know, narrow band image, and there's emission covering the entire disk. And the community says, dude, your pass band must be way wider than you think, and you're getting some continuum emission Mm -hmm. um, contamination coming through because it should only be in the active regions. So a big part of my PhD was like, oh, let me model this stuff. Oh, what we've done here is we found the nature of the upper transition region structures and all these little tiny loops and loop segments. And you got to wait all the way. I published that in 98. And you got to wait all the, no, 99. You have to wait all the way to like 20, 
uh, there's this rocket spectrograph called Iris, imaging spectrograph, know, Iris, that yeah. finally resolved it, and it's exactly the same. And of course, nobody cites that paper either. Mm-hmm. So both of those were were pretty cool. But then I go to Silicon Valley, man. I never saw a silicon wafer. I had no idea how chips were being made. Oh yeah, I remember and the first time I learned that when I was when we first developed bolometry. Mm-hmm. There you go, right? And so here I am. The first thing I do is I apply the same type of astronomical spectroscopy that I was doing to to, to semiconductor manufacturing, and I develop all these um, diagnostics, in-situ spectroscopic process diagnostics that yields me like three different patents. And then I go into the experimental lab, and I actually develop the techniques for the last generation of planar transistors, right? I was able to to, to figure out, because they were moving from silicon on silicon dioxide Mm -hmm. To, to tungsten or some other reactive react refractory metal on mm-hmm. high K dielectrics or thin dielectrics. And so I worked out those etch processes, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, that stuff was, was crazy. But then the other thing that happened was more recent. My graduate student came to me and said, hey, you know, I told them to look for these scale invariant self-similar processes and make sure you look to see fields that are adjacent to ours to see if you can apply what we know to that field and my graduate student is like, Dr. O, I see this process called torsional spine reconnection that seems to be scale invariant. It happens in galaxy cores, on star surfaces, planetary magnetospheres. If we can do it in the lab, we can harness this and we can have the world's fastest ion propulsion technology. Well, guess what we did? We worked up the theory and simulations for his thesis, and now he founded a company and we, you know, I've just advised them over the last year, but they've built a prototype, a working prototype in the lab, you know? So um, that's also pretty cool. But any damn thing, you you know, I do a lot of lab work. So I also did the first four-sided buttable packaging for large um, detectors, like that's on um, the dark energy camera and now going on. So would you consider yourself, uh, I mean, you say my field, the field of, well, which I came in particle physics, but I mean, you're either a theorist or an experimentalist. Yeah. But you consider yourself... Ne- I'm a both? mercenary. I'm a yeah. science mercenary, dude. Yeah, but you do both. Yeah, I mean, and it's great if you can do yeah. both. I think it's great. I yeah. wish I'd been able yeah. to do more experiments or a- any experiments. Man, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But, you know, I want to... You know what I want to do, man? I, my, my, my first... You know, I'm, you know, I'm getting older and I'm like, look, I want to do something fundamental, groundbreaking, yeah. cosmological yeah. in yeah. theory, yeah. Yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, good luck. You're telling me. You're, yeah. you're telling me. But you, you got to find a good problem. You know, that's the thing. You got to yeah. find a good problem to sink your teeth in. Yeah. Well, good. And a problem that's solvable. There are a lot of good problems. Exactly. Like, what's the nature of dark energy? But that ain't going to be solved for a long time. Wow. Yeah, you're telling me, man. I, you're I telling have bets me. on that, although the people involved, including one with Stephen Hawking, they never admitted we, they, they lost their bet. Uh, anyway, uh, about what, you, what? Wait, Stephen Hawking lost a bet to you? Is that yeah, what you just told Yeah, me? but about, actually, a few other people, two, one or two Nobel yeah. Prize winners as well. But about uh, they argued that at the time that we they they were sure we'd know the nature of dark energy. This was oh. in ninety. This was in two thousand four. They said in ten yeah. years. I said, believe me, you're not going to know it in ten years. It's not going. You're not going to know it for anyway. Well, we know it, matter, man. We got I was the right, but I didn't get the parameters. The cosmological constant. We're we're good to go. <laughs> anyway, well, it look. It's this. It's this. You're absolutely right. By the way, yeah. I remember once talking to Stephen Weinberg about this, um, and I think he's written about it too. People mm. don't realize how intimidating it is. If you're a theorist, like we were, yeah. we are, or, um, yeah. uh, certainly like Steve and I were in, in this field of particle physics, it's incredibly intimidating to think that something you're working on late at night in, in your, in a, in a, it is, has any relationship to what's actually out there. It is, <laughs> right. Yeah. It is so, and, and it is so shocking when it works out to be, but it's, it really is intimidating to think that somehow the world is, is, is obeying some rule that you've argued it should be obeying. Mm. And it is really, and it, and the one or two times in my life that has happened where it's really been right. It's really kind of the most amazing thing. I know obviously dark yeah. energy is the biggest surprise, but yeah. big, I mean, the biggest validation in a way, but, but uh, yeah, it's really kind of, if you're a scientist, it, it, people think that, I mean, you have to have faith and I, I don't like to use the word faith, but you, you do have to have, in order to work on something for a year and some of my colleagues have worked on something for 20 yeah. years, you right. have to in your heart think that it's probably right. But at the same time, there's a part of you thinks there's no way it can be right. There's no exactly. Way. There's yeah. No way. yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting dichotomy, the experience right. of, of science that way. And it's great. Yeah. And it's a humility, I think. It's who humil- um, it, it, And absolutely. people often say scientists are humble, but it's the re- recognition because most of the time, you know, I've written a lot of papers and most of the time 
the universe hasn't been smart enough to do what I said it should do. Well, you know, that whole thing about scientists being humble, too, you know, one of the things that I always say is when you look at the layperson conversation about scientists, I feel like a lot of people think that every 50 years or so, we go in a room, all the world scientists, yeah, yeah, and, we, and it's always the same topic. Yeah. What's the lie we're all going to agree on? Yeah, 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 you exactly. Know? And the secret handshake. Yeah, we're climate fact, change. Yeah, we're in fact, people Evolution, don't realize you, most people go to work trying to show their colleagues wrong, but that's the... Yeah, we. Yeah, you, 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 uh, you go. You give a talk in your own group, and they just attack you nonstop. And that's right? great. And that, and, and that's, that's the great. problem with modern education is people are. That's great. You know, if it's that dialectic that keeps science going, and yet some people, yeah. how dare you question my belief? I because can't believe that I'm triggered, yeah. and now I'm intimidated, and now I'm victimized, and that's a real problem with undergraduate education in this yeah. country. I see now oh, is that you can't, you can't. You can't have well, an open I, I, conversation attacking ideas. And it's not people. It's exactly. ideas. Exactly. That's the it's key ideas. point. You got to attack the idea, not the people. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, the thing, I think that when you're talking about learners and you're talking about people coming in with cultural, I don't want to use the word baggage, but basically cultural stories, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and you know, it, it's so hard to reveal your ignorance. Like I've always been comfortable revealing my ignorance. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I will be in a room at a table tomorrow and you use a word I don't know. I'm like, I have what? You know, <laughs> stop the presses. What's that word, right? Yeah. And nobody treats me like I'm an idiot yeah. for it. Maybe behind my back, they're yeah. all saying it, yeah. but you know, to my face, everybody's like, you're a smart guy, yeah, right? Yeah, but, yeah. I, but I, but I, you know, the, the magnitude of what I don't know compared to the tiny yeah, freaking yeah, sliver yeah, that yeah. I know, you know, I feel like an idiot at all times, yeah. you know, well, that's the right attitude. Yeah. Man, <laughs> hey man, it's the reality, right? If you look at subtract what you know from all there is to be known, yeah. what are you left with? All there is to be known. <laughs> like, you know. yeah, so I have why, no, that's why I like my new, I mean, the, the, the new book is in a sense, the edge of knowledge It's it's what we, yeah. what we know we don't know. But in right. fact, what the book I'd like to write is the unknown unknowns and stuff we don't know we don't know. But that'd be That's a very right. short book because yeah. if, we don't, if we knew it, we'd children. call it known unknowns. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, look, it's that training. I wanted to and talk about what you know that ain't so. Go ahead. Yeah. Is it's a surprise that you're right. The willingness to be wrong. Yeah. That is so central to science and the and and the willingness to change your mind. Yeah. And and, and now I want to go to the what the reason. As I say, the reason I first knew about you, the reason yeah. I, I first asked you to be on this a while ago yeah. was this James Webb story. And I'm so happy yeah. that it expanded into other things. Yeah. It's, it, but it's an example of exactly that, <clears throat> of, 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 being, of thinking, you know, this is likely and this is probably the case. But you know what? The evidence doesn't support it. I'm willing to change right. my mind. And then coming up with, with the reaction of people who are supposedly scientists Supposedly, who, who are who, who demonstrate no characteristics of science. None. So let's talk about let's talk about James. Yeah. So a lot of people aren't too aware of this con of this yeah. controversy, even though even though um uh um what what's his name who I liked a lot uh, at the New York Times wrote about it. And that, oh yeah, Michael Powell. Ma Ma yeah, and he's yeah. got a great gig at the Times, and I've written to him. I mm -hmm. want to do a podcast with him, but um. Nice. So James Webb Space Telescope. I remember when I first right. heard James Webb. I never he was. I wasn't thrilled because he wasn't right. a scientist. But then I, yeah. you know, learned why it was named. And then, um, why, why don't you just give us a quick, a brief overview of the history, starting with 2015 or whatever? Yeah, yeah. So s story. You know, I got to know certain people because of this. Yeah. Um, the Webb family, and the fact that I just gave him COVID, and uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm recovering from COVID. I had lunch, breakfast with them last week, and I gave him COVID. Oh, isn't that nice of you? Well, I gave my wife COVID. She still hasn't <laughs> me. anyway. Yeah, but also Sean O'Keefe and I have had uh -huh. some dialogue about his reasoning for um, naming the Webb Telescope, and it's uh -huh. and it's very compelling, man. Okay. And if you look into, I didn't know anything about Sean O'Keefe, but if you look into Webb, who Webb is, mm -hmm. Sean O'Keefe is sort of like a baby Webb in a way, mm -hmm. in the sense that he's a bureaucrat nerd administrative nerd right okay, yeah it, um so anyway in 2015 the first article i read read is the one with the title the problem naming observatories for bigots yeah by matthew francis who i understand is a physicist and also a journalist supposedly yeah he doesn't write yeah. like one but anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, that's all the article of his i've ever read so yeah, yeah, i know when reading that i wouldn't yeah. want to pick up any others but anyway okay yeah yeah i know it's it's, it's bad it wasn't it it wasn't rigorous yeah um but i read it and i was like oh this is shocking to me mm -hmm. why would nasa do that mm -hmm. if that's true 
So now let me, you know, I'm the type of guy, by the way, who when I hear a result, you know, I'm like, if this holds, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm yeah. not accepting anything. Right. You know, and, and let's not judge too hard. So the claim was that the, 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 to step back. Well, oh, here's maybe, the claim. Oh, okay. Here's okay. the claim. So the claim was, first off, in the title, that the man is a homophobe. Yeah. The second thing is, was that he oversaw the purge of gay people from federal service in the late 40s, early 50s, and that he personally fired um, 92 or 91 employees between 47 and early 1950, and that he had given this Senate testimony, and that he had made this a uh, very homophobic statement about gay people not having the being perverted the same and not having morals emotional stability of normal yeah, yeah, persons yeah, yeah, or something yeah. like that right very specific right so when i read this i'm like okay that sounds pretty damning let me google and see what else i can find and i found an article that was written 5 months earlier by Dan Savage where it basically said exactly the same thing yeah, i looked at read the other right? article yeah, as that article and then you know that article referred to his Wikipedia page. So I went to the Wikipedia page, the same quote is there. And then I turned to our Facebook group that was called Equity and Inclusion in Science. And I see that people have been talking about that and people are like, oh, someone should confront NASA. That's so, a, that's a, let me make it clear. That's a group you're a part of? Then a Facebook. Well, it was a Facebook group. It's not a group that I was a part of. It was a closed Facebook group that somebody was like, hey, join this, oh, right? Okay. So I'm a lurker, right? Okay. I don't, you know. Yeah. I'm not reading emails. I'm not contributing yeah, to groups. Okay. I'm over here thinking, yeah, all right, okay. yeah. and, and handling business. Yeah, so yeah. I t I would go there from time to time, but I wasn't a big participant, right? Yeah. I'd go and see what they were talking about. So I thought that was a natural place to go. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I go and look and discover that, yeah, they had been talking about it for half a year. Mm -hmm. And people were like, someone should confront NASA. Mm -hmm. And everybody seemed to accept it was true, except this one guy who said something along the lines of, hey, before doing that, you should make sure you have the full story straight. So what happens? A year and a half later, I find myself working at NASA headquarters. Mm -hmm. And once I figure out the lay of the land, I go right to the head of strategic communications. I'm like, yo, you know about this? And they're like, no, oh no, this looks terrible. Mm -hmm. Let's go talk to the head of, you know, they assumed I knew who Gregory Robinson was. Like, Let's go talk to Gregory Robinson. I'm like, who's that, right? They're like, oh, you know, the head of the Webb Telescope. So we go talk to Gregory Robinson. You know, he's a very sober, very deliberate dude. Yeah. And he's like, hmm. Not very reactive. He's like, oh, that's news. Hakeem, send me everything you got. I sent it to him. I sent him the two articles. I sent him a Wikipedia article. Yeah. And he says to me a week later, he's like, Hakeem, all I see here are accusations, man. Can yeah. you look into it and see what actually happened? So I started looking into it. And at first I started by myself. You know, I, I discovered, you know, there was a Truman Library and yeah. there was the web papers and, and these sort of things. You've written about and I'm that looking idea. for this specific <laughs> quote from Webb. I'm looking for this specific congressional testimony from Webb, and I can't find it anywhere. So then I turn back to the head of strategic communications. who happened to be my direct report. You know, I report directly to her. Yeah. And she goes, well, you know, we got these great historians and archivists and librarians. So I go down there and I get to know this one guy really well. And he turns me on to people at Johnson Space Center, people at um, in Huntsville at Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. And there is even a graduate student in history at University of Alabama, Huntsville, who's doing his PhD dissertation on web. Mm -hmm. And now what all these people give me is, I have no idea about this stuff, Hakeem, but we do you know about this stuff he did at NASA with diversity? Yeah. And so, you know, what's really funny is when I left NASA in uh, end of August, 2019, I left everything behind because I was so like, you know, nervous about government property. Yeah, you know? yeah. Good. <laughs> and now, if only, now our, if only you know who was too. But anyway, go on. Now it's so big thing in the news. But yeah. you know what the thing was is graduate student man. Everybody knows about how Webb took on George Wallace. Yeah. Excuse me, took on Wallace at the um the the, the governor yeah. in, in Alabama. But what they didn't know that this guy gave me were letters between Webb and these Mississippi congressmen, black congressmen, mm -hmm. where they were systematically taking on segregation in Mississippi as well. Um, so now I'm really confused. I'm like, wait a minute, this dude persecuted gay people and now he's like helping black people? Like what the, what kind of personality is this dude, right? Yeah, yeah. So then this archivist of me goes, Hakeem, I think it may be a case of mistaken identity because he finds where John Purifoy was the person who had given the congressional testimony. Mm -hmm. And then right after this, I find this document from the Senate where they talk about, with Purifoy's name, where they mm -hmm. talk about how they created the, the um, security apparatus 
in the Cold War, right after yeah. World War II. Yeah. And, you know, and I find this book and now I'm starting to see the story unfold. So I realize, ah, every 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 detail that they had given for Webb did this, Webb did this, Webb did this. All of them were actually done by Carlisle Hubelstein and John Purifoy. Yeah. All right. So I'm like, there is zero evidence. And if you look, one of the main um, people who were pushing this had an article in Physics Today in 2019 where they go on to say, I know, use the word no, yeah. that Webb prevented gay people from working at NASA in the 60s, right? That's very specific. Webb yeah, did that. Yeah, I know. Right. I, it is, they just say it, and I know it. And, I, and, then, and then other people know it because they wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And all of it is, is untrue, right? So I write this, and I expect that, you know, not I don't expect it to be big news. Because I didn't, yeah. you know, I expect it to be like, oh, a few people are concerned with this. The gay people in the community may be concerned with this. And now everybody will be relieved to know that it mm-hmm. turns out it's not true. Yeah. But that is not what happened. Yeah. I mean, you'd think that you wrote, I remember in your piece, when you wrote the piece and I read it, it's basically, yeah. hey, now finally astronomers don't have to worry. We can move on to other things. It should be yeah. a relief. Yeah. But in fact, the reaction is the opposite. Well, I didn't know that there were members of our community who were actually, um, had some personal connection with this uh, rumor that, that somehow it was their item. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. And if, and if I had known that, I don't know what I would have done differently, but maybe I would have expected the backlash that occurred from those specific people. And the crazy thing about it is this other astronomer who knew to both of us, who knew all, you know, all of us said, Hey, I came, I thought you guys had a cordial relationship with one of the two leaders of this thing. Yeah. The one who wrote the article titled, the straits are here to serve, save us. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I thought we did too, right? So I go to that person. He says, why don't you uh, apologize to them for any hurt feelings you may have caused? And on day one, I'm like, no way, yeah. right? But day two, I'm like, oh, I see how you phrase that. Any hurt feelings I may have caused. So I did it. I wrote to them on Twitter in my DMs, mm-hmm. yeah. which I still keep mm-hmm. private. Yeah. And I said, hey, you know, I understand that this may have caused some hurt feelings. Listen. That wasn't my intention. And if you want, I will use my voice, since I'm somewhat of a public figure, to bring attention to the Lavender Scare. Yeah. And man, they weren't having it. They kind of went in at me. And then they said the phrase of, if you had submitted it to a journal, you'd be retracting it. And at that point, I was done with the conversation, right? Yeah. Because, you know, if you're, I say this like, like, you know, how I go home and and people confront me about being a scientist, they're like, you know, the Big Bang ain't real. And I'll say, yeah. okay, well, tell me what specifically is, is incorrect. Yeah. The Hubble expansion data, the nucleosynthesis data, or the cosmic microwave background <laughs> radiation data, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So just telling me, blank, you know, you'll be retracting it. I'm like, okay, which part of it is, is incorrect? So what they do then is they start creating these false narratives, yeah. right? So after this blog- well, they, they, it, Let's make it clear. They had already created a false narrative. They had already false created a false narrative. was one about Webb, but it was a, yeah. the, the, the thing that I, I'm, I'm going to parse well, more carefully. The Web. thing they refused to do was once that narrative was shown to be false, what yeah. a real scientist would do would say, wow, okay, that I thought that was the case, but it's false. But these people demonstrate that they're ideologues and they're not scientists. Absolutely. Exactly. Because they say, no, we're no. doubling down. You can't be right. You can't but, be right. But the you know what else I believe do? it's true. So if the evidence says no. otherwise, the evidence is wrong. Oh, no, no, no. But see, you have to look at their relationship with evidence. Okay. So one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, I go to go to these public talks just like you, and people come after me, come to me after my talk, and they'll say, sir, you said that science says this, but, you know, my holy book or some other source says that. And I'm going to, and I correct them. I say, listen, that's not the... You know, I don't talk to them about their faith or whatever. Yeah, I talk yeah, to them yeah. about science and understanding how mm-hmm. that works. And the point I make is science doesn't say anything. Science asks. Yeah. Science says, universe, tell me, what are you? Yeah. So what they went about doing is, let me see if I can find some piece of evidence that supports my perspective, yeah. even tangentially. Yeah. And I will say it does. So what do they do? They find very quickly this this one astronomer associated with them who wasn't part of their core crew, Adrian Lucy, is like, look, I found this passage in David K. Johnson's book. So mm-hmm. David K. Johnson is a historian. He's a gay historian. And he's the person who actually coined the phrase the Lavender Scare. Mm-hmm. And in his book, he speaks of this meeting between Truman and Webb. And he uses this phrase saying that human tr- Webb had spoken to this senator who was going to oversee the um, Senate committee that was going to investigate whether or not, 
you know, with the way they called it was the problem with homosexuals in federal mm-hmm. government, right? And they made it seem like Truman and Webb had this special meeting and that Webb was a planner and leader of it, mm-hmm. which was not the case, right? Truman and Webb had met regularly for years mm-hmm. because Webb used to run his own agency, the Bureau mm-hmm. of the Budget, right? Yeah. And and one thing that we all have heard that he created at that time is called economic indicators, right? Mm-hmm. Webb created that. So he's this star administrative, you know, nerd. Yeah. And Truman is looking at what's happening globally. And he tells his secretary of state, yo, I'm going to install Webb as your number two, to which Atchison is like, who? Yeah. No. Yeah. And even Webb is like, dude, I don't have any experience yeah. in foreign affairs. He's like, yes, but you have experience with organization. And that's what we need, right? Okay. So what happens is Webb is the unconflicted party in a battle that's been going between the senators and the executive branch. So when Senator Hoey runs into Webb, he says, hey, man, can you and I talk about this? Because the Senate was trying to get these personnel papers of the people who had been investigated for for disloyalty, right, which include communists, which include gay people, which include people who were gamblers, who saw prostitutes, who were Mm -hmm. cheaters, right? Anybody who could be you know, looked at as somebody who could be blackmailed or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So Webb has his regular meeting with Truman and he tells him at the end of the meeting, it has several topics, right? And at the end of the meeting, he goes, oh, by the way, Senator Hoey asked me to attend this meeting on the homosexual problem. Should I do it? He's like, oh yeah, tell him we'll find a way to work around the challenges Mm -hmm. with working together, not finding the modus operandi. Yeah. So here's the crazy thing. When they find this piece, the NARA, the National Archives record Mm -hmm. reference is given. And Adrian Lucy says, hey, because of the pandemic, they're shut down. Mm -hmm. But they know that there is that 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 Johnson has paraphrased a real memo. But instead of waiting to get the real memo, they go out and says, this proves that Lewis was the leader. And it's in their Scientific American articles and Nature articles. It's all over the place. Yeah, that's how I first I first heard of it from a. Yeah. Let, let me, by the way, let me say you just remind me yeah. one of my favorite quotes. There, well, there are a lot of favorite quotes from my from F- Richard Feynman of mine. Uh, 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 you know, I wrote a book about him. But um, oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, called Quantum Man. By the way, well, well, uh, before before Quantum Life was written, it was called Quantum. Uh, Man. But, um, <laughs> there you go. Years ago, but um, it's a scientific biography, and so it's, got it, got it, it. But um, is it, you know, he said what what you have to do as a scientist is if you have an idea, you you look, you try and prove it right, but you try equally hard to prove it wrong prove it wrong and that's exactly. the thing that you so you say okay i found this bit of evidence but is yeah. there evidence that shows this wrong and and that and that's the exact what they did is the exact thing yeah. we know that he must have been a homophobe we're going to find yeah. anything that suggests he is and we're not going to yeah. think about anything else and then we're going to promote right. it and, yeah. and and i have to say the first time i heard about even a controversy was this scientific yeah. american article and scientific american unfortunately i was on the board of it it Ooh. used to be a reputable magazine i used anymore. to love it yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wrote six it. articles for it, and yeah. and I used to have a column, and I was on their board for maybe fifteen years, and now it's just mm. it's really deteriorated. But it was a, I, you know, I, I recently talked about the dumbest article I've read recently. But up to that point, it was the dumbest article I'd read. I didn't know mm. anything about it. My yeah. first presumption was, well, here's a guy in the 1950s and 60s, and I'm assuming that he's no different than other people in the 1950s or 60s, and to impose upon, impose modern sensibilities on a man at that time is already silly, but, but I didn't even know that yeah. I didn't even know the details, but then I, I have to ask you this because I, I remember yeah. writing about this and yeah. making fun of it because I thought it was the silliest thing I'd ever heard when they suggested that t- t- telescope be called the Harriet, Harriet. Tubman. Yeah. Fitzgo. Why? Because on the underground railroad, she must've looked at the North star and I thought, are they serious? Was that the stupidest? Was that the dumbest thing? Yeah, you that was pretty. Well, I'm not going to call that dumb. Yeah, I know. Not dumb. Was, I just couldn't was, understand. Yeah. I just thought, what? Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. If you want to make yourself a caricature of ridiculousness, that's that's a yeah, good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's patronizing. I mean, look, it's yeah. clear they wanted a a, a, a a person of color to be. Well, look, name man, it. But, but look, it's just, it's patronizing to do that. Look look how revealing it is, though, right? Yeah. So so after I showed that they that Webb did not do what he specifically did, mm-hmm. they immediately go to literally within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Oh, but he was complicit because he was in management. Yeah. So in their articles, they say, yes, we're saying that anybody who was in management during this time. Well, guess who was in management at NASA with Nancy Grace Roman? Yeah, Nancy, you, you made that point. Nancy Grace Roman yeah. was a man and no one's why arguing they, against that telescope. 
Yeah, they're not arguing the Nancy Grace Roman and the Webb Telescope both both must be yeah. renamed. They didn't make that argument, and if they were sincere, they would have made that argument. Yeah, and it's it's these counter arguments. When I I guess I I discounted the rest of the piece when I read about the suggestion that Harriet Tubman be named it because I figured if there's that level of seriousness or lack of yeah. seriousness, then I've got us then the rest of the history is suspect. So that's how I presume. I mean, and yeah. I could have been wrong. I mean, I made a snap judgment, and I could have been wrong. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but I I thought well, it, this isn't the article to trust. And then I read, you know, I read about your work. And then the important thing was that that your work was later validated by an ex, by an exhaustive NASA. So you wrote this piece and you thought, OK, everyone's going to, hey, yeah. slap me on the back and say, you you know, thanks for doing the real research to see what the real situation yeah. is instead. And we'll talk about it. you got yeah. attacked, not just for what you were oh, saying, yeah. but who you were and aspersions yeah. were, were. Oh, were, absolutely. Yeah. So the first I heard of it was was literally that week. Right. So the same person who wrote the article, the Straits are here to save us. When that other astronomer attempted to mediate, he sent me, he goes, hey, man, this person said I should research why you left Florida Tech. So I called him up and I'm like, what's that about? And he said, oh, something about sexual harassment and, and a title. I literally laughed. Yeah. Because I'm like, who's going to believe that about me? Dude, I'm the biggest nerd. I don't come on to anybody mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. I, this is not how I roll. Yeah. Now, to be honest with you, Lawrence, clearly I must be a very desirable dude because people are coming on to me all the time. <laughs> and, 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 and that includes students, man. And so, yeah. but that's the reality of it is that here I am kicking people back, be, beat it, get off me, back up. I'm not, yeah. you know, and then you're going to be accused, the guy who behaves that way mm-hmm. as the one who's doing I'm like, give me a break. Anyway, I didn't think anybody would believe it. But then I start hearing it coming from everybody. Oh, Hakeem, I was here Mm -hmm. and I heard someone say this. But let me tell you, man, there is real consequences. And I will tell you what it is. So one of the people of the two leaders of it, Mm -hmm. not the person who wrote the article, Mm -hmm. The Straits Are Here to Save Us, Mm -hmm. at their university, a professor informed me that there was an internal discussion about inviting me to be come there and be a speaker for a major event and a paid speaker. Uh And they didn't say exactly who it is, but it's the exact same person. It's a university. Mm -hmm. They had a young astronomy woman, astronomy woman spoke up and said, oh, we can't invite him because he has these sexual um, misconduct allegations, Mm -hmm. right? The same person, once I got hired at at George Mason, actually tweeted that phrase, sexual misconduct, with respect to that hiring, right? But then... In the aftermath of the New York Times article and everything, they've gaslighted the world and said, oh, I wasn't talking about him when they're writing, yeah, someone should ask this guy why he left his university. The exact same thing your colleague said, the exact same phrase, Mm -hmm. you're happening to use that with reference to me, but it's not about, you know, but so it's, it's. You know, they thought they knew something about Webb. They thought they well, knew something say, about there's me. There's a similarity. That's the, that's the, I mean, the ironic part about this is that yeah. making claims about Webb and then making claims about you, in, yeah. w- and, 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 and in either case, the point is that, that, that the, the scientific thing to do is to, yeah. see, is to, is to see the evidence. And it, right. the, the, the similarity between the two is kind of remarkable. It's, it it's, a, it's a proper, and, and I don't want to criticize people so much. We have been. Yeah. But, but it's, it's a thought ideology. process. It's, it's a thought this, process. It's, it's, yeah. it's the ideology that's the antithes, antith, sorry, antithesis of, yeah. of science, which is yeah. instead of being upset when you're wrong, and refusing yeah. to be, and then attacking uh, the people, you know, and, and demanding that your narrative be true right. under all circumstances, and finding reasons to denigrate or 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 uh, reduce the credibility of those people who disagree. The whole point of science is say, "Hey, this is amazing. I'm wrong," and 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 exactly. and, and, and that's exactly. the great thing about science. Yeah. And 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 um, you know, I, I will say that uh, that uh, uh, the well. Let's get to the. Let's end this and then and then end with some yeah. one other thing. The one I want to ask is what can we do? I'm seeing this so often. To to step back from James Webb to step back from the attacks on you, is this mentality that we're seeing of the intrusion? And I've written about it for the Wall Street Journal yeah. and and other places. The intrusion of ideology into science. Man, um, it's, what, it's, can, it's, what can it's, we do? I, it, you know, it I, it's a debate. Right. It, and it needs to be an open debate. But the problem is there's so many people that wish to um, what's the phrase performative 
uh, virtue signaling. Virtue signaling, right? yeah. I mean, virtue signaling <laughs> yeah. is at the heart so of they everything. Think, they think that they're on the right side. So when someone comes to them with grievance, so I'll tell you, there's three, another, the same person, there was a, uh, there's a person who wanted MacArthur Prize, mm-hmm. who's a um, famed current black writer, also from Mississippi. Uh-huh. And that person agreed to blurt my book. We became buddies after we were both speaking at uh-huh. Trinity College in, in, in San Antonio. Uh-huh. In early 2020, I've spoken and to so, Trinity in the old days before oh, yeah. you were born, maybe. But anyway, uh, I was born in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I know it's sure. late. But anyway, um, he says to me, you know, a week before he's like, "Oh man, I can't blurb the book," and I'm like, "Why not?" He's like, "My friend said they'd be very hurt if I did that." So that friend is the same person, yeah. right? Yeah. Now again, there are these two prominent female professors at two major universities that both used to reach out to me often. They publicly are working with this person, and for the last year and a half, they don't know me anymore. I contact them, no reply, and I'm like, okay, I can't wait to to see one of them in person so I can say, hey, the reason why you suddenly don't know me after this engagement is because, you know, and and that's the thing is that if someone says to me, rumor about this person, I always say to that person, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll find out for myself about that person. Unless yeah, that not many, not many people are that way. That's, I mean, I just wrote a piece and then I had a guest post in my yeah. on our, about gu- this guilt by association that's happening where yeah. people. And so that's why I think your friends are acting that way. And, and it's, it's, it's the yeah. innate cowardice of academics, which is innate to keep your head low, not get yeah. involved in any, any controversies, right. better, better you virtue signal and yep. be safer. And if we, if, as long as, as long as you get, as long as the benefit of virtue signaling outweighs the negatives of inappropriately um, uh, making claims, then it's going to continue and universities are going to virtue signal and, and, and it's always going to be a calculation. What, let's say, so is dropping Hakeem as a friend, is that going to be more or or throw him under the bus? Is that going to be a more negative thing for me? Then to virtue signal and and gain within the community right. some rights, as opposed to being guilt by association. I know him and like him. Well, if you like him, then you too must be. And so exactly. So and you know who people, suffered that? Will Kenny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, this third party who doesn't know me ever. Yeah. Tweeted right before the the, the New York Times article came out because Will Kenny was like, "It's wrong the way you guys are are, are, are doing this to Hakeem." This woman tweets, "Oh, when you see people." Uh, protecting abusers. That usually means they're abusers themselves. Watch out for these two. Yeah, yeah, and, no, that's the kind of that, and that's, but that's the kind of, in, that's what I'm seeing in academia, that kind of insidious sort of Stasi, uh, what you expect from the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, we can, this person knows that person, and therefore they, they, and we're seeing that, and I, we need to, we need to overcome that. We need to get away from that. And it is a problem in academia. And at the same time, um, um, you know, to, to, so man, look, I, we, I operate, I operate in several business communities. You know, yeah. I'm like you, I'm entrepreneurial out yeah. here. I deal with the, 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 the media people. I deal yeah. with the writer people. I, you know, I do, I speak mm-hmm. and I'm dealing with particular yeah. communities yeah. and I'm, man, there is no place I work in that is as toxic as astronomy is with the virtue signaling and, and it's this a, it's a, it's an unfortunate thing. We need to change it yeah. because, because the problem is it's not just people being hurt. It's not just it's not just a false narrative being propagated. It's that science yeah. can't be done because when people are afraid, yeah. when people are driven by fear, and we saw it in the Soviet Union, when people are mm. driven by fear, they can't do good science because they mm. can't ask questions. They can't be open. Yeah. They're afraid of what people are going to say. And for a yeah. purpose, science has got to be, a, and and it would be great if society, democracy were too. But but science cannot function effectively if people are afraid to ask questions. Or afraid to interact with each other, and that's yeah. that's a real problem. Now yeah. I want to you know end... what, man? What? Go ahead, go ahead. No, I always feel weird because you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm a you know gregarious and affable guy. Mm-hmm. So I I have colleagues going back. You know, everywhere I go, I leave a trail of love behind me, mm-hmm. right? And so, man, I will be somewhere and somebody go, oh, Hakeem. The first thing they do, give me a big hug, right? <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, didn't the AAS pass a law? No more hugging. You know, I'm just <laughs> yeah. like. It's this is the type of thing you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's like we're stripping away humanity. Well, from... uh, you know, I wrote a piece. I mean, there's a big problem when people are asking, you know, we, 
seeing this person's name on a paper triggers me and therefore you have no, to take I their name off the too. bigger paper. Yeah. And that, that's just the antithesis of science because you're saying, well, wow. I'm taking, you know, I'm not giving, we used to call it plagiarism. If you don't put someone's name in the paper, it right. doesn't work. Yeah. And so yeah. anyway, it is a problem. And I think it's important to talk yeah. about the problem because I think more academics have to stand up. Ultimately, it's not going to be solved until the academic community says, we won't put up with this nonsense anymore. You're empowering We, we care about the ideas and you, and, and it's not, and you, you, we don't care about, we care about the ideas mm. and, and that's what matters. And, and, yeah. and so I do want to segue back to one question I have for you. And then it relates to, to, um, it, interestingly, it covers also the, the web because I think, I think, yeah. um, um, anyway, you'll see what I mean in a second. All right, all um, right. I, I have to ask you, and I understand more having read your book. Yeah. And looking at the organizations that that impacted on you, the 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 yeah. black fraternities and the yeah. and and the black professional organizations, yeah. My attitude has always been skeptical of groups like the National Society of Black Physicists. Okay, yeah. you're and not alone. I hear it. I and hear I, it. And, and because you know, I would never. I mean, obviously, I would never become part of a, a National Society of White Physicists, or for that matter, a National Society of Jewish Physicists. Or yeah. national, I mean, I just, I'm, right, right. you know, I never want to be a member of a club that right. I have me as a member anyway. But, right, right. but so why, why the National Society of Black Physicists? I think I understand it more having read yeah. the book, but I'd like to hear you say Right, it. yeah. Well, if, if you look at the inception of the organization, it's written on the history of the website, mm -hmm. right? And, and so there was some event that happened, national event, and the black physicists at the time felt like the um, professional societies and organizations that existed on this racial issue were not being um, sensitive to their particular concerns and, and what they needed to felt like needed to be said. And so they said, okay, for this reason, we might need to, to start our own organization. But then it morphed, right? It began to morph because what it became was a gathering where they get together annually. You know, you don't see another black physicist for the, your whole year. And then yeah, annually yeah, you get like, hey, hello, fellow black yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Again, African-Americans are a different type of ethnicity. Like when I live in a community, I love to go to things like, oh, the Greek church, you know, they have their annual thing and they do their traditional Greek dance. Yeah. Or, you know, we go to India week and you're seeing Indian culture and food. Yeah. The fact that you gather together culturally in order to celebrate yourselves and in order to uh you know look at what may concern challenges to your community specifically and these sort of things i see that as a good thing no matter what it is right if it's not an exclusionary oh we're going to get together and take over the world and hate and kill everybody else okay that's bad uh -huh. but if it's like oh you know we all are the the great great grandchildren of George Washington, and we're gathering together every year to celebrate this, right? But what happens is, is that the African-American population is going through a different evolution than the rest of America, right? Because it goes through, from this evolution of being in a state of race-based shadow slavery, then Reconstruction, then Jim Crow, yeah. and there's a relationship with education and access to education, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing about it is, is that all societies in America, no matter what your race is, nobody's interested in science and, no, and certainly nobody's interested in physics. And I like to point out that for a quarter of a century, we've been pushing this STEM thing so hard mm -hmm. because it's so important to national health. Yeah. But yet only 18% of our undergraduates today graduate with STEM degrees. Mm -hmm. And so these black physicists at a certain time started saying, hey, let's use this to mentor each other, mm -hmm. the, the youth. But also now around the 90s when I started, right, they started in 77. Yeah. Let's start creating what people call a pipeline. Let's start dealing with students and mentoring students to bring them into it. Because even if you're interested in this stuff, you have no way of, of, of knowing how to go about it's it. It's that pipeline that I, I mean, I get to appreciate yeah. more when I but, saw your life. Uh, yeah. that's and, right. and also that's right. Jim Gates, who I saw at an MIT, Jim was mentored yeah. by someone and I saw him mentoring a graduate student. Oh yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and so what happens is now you know, I, on the one hand is I do see the conflict, I, you know, I see things that people don't talk about, right? I say a lot of things that are different. Like I say like, oh yeah, 
I was abused by black police and white police. I've had guns put on me by black guys and white guys. Yeah. So I'm lucky. Yeah. I see that it's not a race thing. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not a, you know, yeah. it's, it's a, you know, it's a people behaving badly thing. But historically, it is a race thing. Historically, if you don't have somebody in your home who got education, you know, good luck, under, you know, navigating that process. My life, like, you know, I couldn't compete with my own son, you know, mm-hmm. if, you know, his, him coming out of high school and me coming out of high school, completely different universes of people. But again, I am what you would call what they, you know, legacy heritage, African-American. Yeah. That's different from somebody who's coming from the Caribbean mm-hmm. or Africa. America is the land of opportunity, yeah. right? They've had a hardcore mathematics, English system, mm-hmm background versus me in America getting educated in Mississippi, right? So you see a Stefan Alexander, you see a, um, what's my man's name at University of Illinois, right? A Nadia Mason, you know, you see Mm -hmm. Art Walker, right? He's from that Caribbean tradition. You know, you you interface differently. And so on the one hand, the NSBP serves as a mentor network to help people navigate making it into this field. But here's the thing. We are not exclusionary. What do I do as an NSVP mentor? I say, hey, yo, Lawrence, you're an expert on this. I got this great student. They're interested in that. Come work. Mm-hmm. So the, the, when we have our mentor networks, we're not all connected with black physicists. We're connecting with the top physicists in the field. So who do we have relationships with? The more the the the, the Simons Foundation, the Heisen mm-hmm. Simons mm-hmm. Foundation. Mm-hmm. Our students aren't working with black scientists. They're working with scientists that are the top mm-hmm. in the field at what they do. So... I'm a, I am a big tent guy. I am a not exclusionary. You know, I'm a like, let's build bridges. Let's do this. But you have to recognize that just like when they created th- that welfare state to prevent us from falling in the slums and all of that, we still have to go to every community that identifies as a community and get these people engaged. For one, if I was running a country, right, if I had a nation and I'm like, you know, I'm Hakeem. So if I am running a nation, I'm looking at taking over the world, then the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> what do I want my nation to be? just won. There's 100 billion. You know, hey, man, anyway. and in the universe, right? <laughs> Give me the, I want the, 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 the infinity gauntlet. Okay. But, uh, and, and Thanos was wrong. He shouldn't have killed 50% of everybody. That's one doubling time, right? Yeah, he yeah. should have killed the minimal viable population. That's what should remain. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the point is, mm-hmm. is that, um, you know, if you isolate yourself as a people, that is a recipe for death. For disaster. Right? If you, if for diversity disaster. Diversity shouldn't be exclusionary. And That's not what we're doing. No, right? exactly. We're making it, partnerships it's more of an oper- with what, you know, all what it the is, best. You forget what I see it as, and I think I understood it more reading your book, is as a saying, yeah. hey, we have an opportunity to, to mentor, to help, and we're going to use that opportunity. And if you want to have a group, Absolutely. I mean, it wouldn't be acceptable, but I mean, we, you know, but I guess... You know, there'd be other, any other group that wants to use the, a common cultural or ethnic hook as a way to help people um, is great. Of course, from my point of view, I'd just rather help everyone without an ethnic hook, but that's just the way I am. But, but well, here's the thing it's like black colleges, right? Black colleges don't exclude white people from attending. Yeah. I had black, white students at my black college, yeah. right? But the thing is that if that black college isn't there, then there's no, those black. There's no place for yeah, a lot yeah, of those. Yeah, and, and that, go, that, that's right? the point is to provide an opportunity. Yeah, and I see that. And 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 the reason I, and the reason I'm saying, believe it or not, that it connects in the end and, uh, to to the James yeah. Webb thing is it, it's I think the same people that were arguing about this ideology about James Webb produce when it comes to physics kind of the same kind of hate exclusionary a- attitude. And the one person who wrote, I think, wrote one of these pieces. I, I, I wrote a piece, on, you know, on on white epistemology, which I made fun of yeah. in a different point of view. Somehow saying that 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 the problem with physics is it wasn't, it's not objective because they don't value black women, and it was somehow it would be. And I was shocked. And one of the examples yeah. that was used was string theory. You know, they're willing to believe in eleven dimensions, but not believe in black women. I felt like saying, well, you know, Jim Gates is a great string theorist, <laughs> and and I, you know, it, it demonstrated an extreme a willingness to throw out, this was a physics article, to throw yeah. out sensible physics to make an ideological point. 
and to be exclusionary. Yeah. Oh, and, and, or and, the and when point that, that dark matter with, is somehow racist. Yeah, yeah, or, or whiteboards are somehow racist. There's no articles on it. But, but wow. this same – that somehow these people get academic positions that are willing to throw out physics for the sake Man, of ideology. The, it's before, shocked me. It shocked me. Before there was woke, mm-hmm. there was, you know, this thing called being Afrocentric. Yeah. And within the black community of America, they started to make fun of certain types of ways of thinking. Right. You know, the guys who will be like, why are the black olives in a can where you can't see them, but the green olives are in a glass. Right. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at like Wayans Brothers movies and stuff, they yeah. make fun of these guys. Right. Yeah. And this is that exact same type of thinking that people make fun of within the black community. But for some reason in this modern era, you know, and, and and if you look at that 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 sort of philosophy, you know, it's it's, it's sort of like an activist's mm-hmm. philosophy, yeah. and that is, oh, I must find something to activate about. So you go about looking for evidence, and if there's, you know, th- I just don't understand coming up with these sort of narratives that are just like so ridiculous they're ridiculous but, but the they're fact being empowered is that people are afraid to say it because then but they empower them that's yeah, the yeah, thing it, they're it like empowers hey, them. And, and, and empowers yeah. that kind of exactly it empowers people and 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 you feel if, if you don't virtue signal if you don't say oh well this these people have something to say then 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 you're gonna be attacked and and we need to we need to we need to point out nonsense where it's nonsense regardless of who says it and and um and yet, at the same time, be positive. I mean, I think that yeah, right, I think right. that I want to end on a positive people, note. But you can talk about ideas and yeah. their validity, and and and, and you can attack ideas. Attacking yeah. ideas and attacking people are very different. Very different and, things. Yeah. And um, and there's no way. Well, I won't even go when people say somehow they're vulnerable. How dare uh, Hakeem attack me? He's a senior. It's, oh it's man, I've bullshit. been attacked. Some yeah, people have. Yeah. Those people have have they have their their megaphones and they're not vulnerable at all. But but the but I think the whole point is that we need right. to look forward and to try and overcome this too shall pass. It Absolutely. is a problem. We have to speak about it. And I'm glad you and I spoke about it. And I'm mm. sure we're going to raise hackles by having spoken about it. But yeah, absolutely. But one thing I want to say, man, is again, if you look at what's happening in the labs, in the, on the everyday level, you know, when I go into, you know, university yeah. of Washington yeah. lab, or yeah. I go into my university of Berkeley lab, or yeah. I went to my Princeton lab with the people I yeah. work with. Yeah. I've selected to work with people like Art Walker said yeah. that are, yeah. you know, like, like one joke I used to tell when I talked to students to be provocative was the day I forgot I was black. Yeah. Right. Why did I tell this joke? Because man, it's on your mind, right? Yeah. When I'm at Stanford, you know, class is an issue, yeah. you know, race is an issue. I go to Silicon Valley is it's completely different character but it's an issue, mm-hmm. right? You know, because it's more of an immigrant community type thing and yeah, more yeah. of people, you know, more, you know, we're going to stick together. Yeah. It's not, I hate you because you're something different, right? Just like, cause you're something different, mm-hmm. but you know, we're going to gather together and keep mm-hmm. our knowledge proprietary because we're the same. Right. But then one day I'm at Berkeley and I'm sitting in the colloquium. I'm like, Oh my God, I forgot I was black. I was just sitting <laughs> here looking at the science and listening. Right. Because that was the first time that I was among a group of other professionals where Never really came up like yeah. that, right? Yeah, we were, you know, you know, very diverse group of people from all over the world, and we would focus on cosmology. And I think right? that's the important thing to point, also to point out, is that yeah. for the most part in science, and in, no, in spite of what some of these noisy people are saying about their inability to do this or the presence of racism here, there, most of the time you're in a in a scientific meeting and you're debating, and 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 for the and and happily. Science yeah. still works because 95% of the time, that's what it's all about is the ideas and people don't care. Yeah. And, and, and it's these fringe things where people are claiming that, that all of these things are happening yeah. that are, that are giving you the illusion that this is central to science. Just like I used to say, by the way, right. you know, I used to call myself an anti-theist and, and, and Ooh. I'm famous because my friend Christopher Hitchens used to call himself that. And, yeah. and. And now I say I'm an apathyist because because <laughs> because I don't give a damn because it never comes up. People seem to think right. that God is central in our discussions of science. We never uh, comes up. It's irrelevant. Yeah, right. And we right, we yeah. again seem to make it seem like race is so important. And it's and and at least in my experience well, as a listen, scientist, it's been irrelevant. But here's the thing about it is that it has an when it does come up, 
it has a disproportionate impact on people's psyche. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so I'll, I'll buy that. that's the that's the that's the thing is that it you know if you're a woman, you're gonna run into some dude who's gonna wants to make you feel bad. So he's gonna say people go for what's easy, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And and there are a group. The character has a range. A Gaussian too. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna come across somebody. So somebody might talk about your appearance. Somebody might talk about your height. Somebody might talk. You know, and all these things come up. So people are saying bad things to people. But, it's not. And, and but, but what we have to do is train our kids to say, you know, yeah. it, you're, you are, no matter who you are, where you come from, you're going to come up with bullies and you're come up, you're going to be, yeah. you're going to get people who are going to put you down. They're going to be people, yeah. people who make you upset and you have to learn how to deal with it. It's called yeah, growing up. It. It's called yeah, growing but it's up. It's also it's, called resiliency. And so and, the and, thing that I've come under recent you know, I, I see people talking about, you know, we talk about the, the DE and I stuff yeah. and people are talking about training people to be nice to each other. Uh-huh. I also say, you know, you have to also train people to be resilient. That resilient. Right? Learn how to say, hey, but, let, but people see children. that as putting the responsibility on a person that's being victimized in the per- per situation. But I'm like, listen, you have to because, listen, I, I you know, I'm, I'm older. So younger yeah. people come to me and sometimes they say, oh. Something's going on, this, that, and the other, say that. And the, I, the first thing I want to say is, well, don't be so damn soft, yeah, right? I mean, don't let if somebody you, if you, it's, be it's like saying you. worrying is, is being punished twice. It's the same thing, but right. if you don't feel victimized, then you probably, and then, then yeah. that's a huge way to not be victimized. You know what? I'm not saying don't feel victimized, just, just, but if you do feel victimized, use that as fuel you, for your fire. Yeah, yeah. say right. it. Respond yeah. or just say that guy's an idiot. Yeah. You, there's a whole I'm, bunch of tools. I'm all about use. kicking ass, Lawrence. Yeah. yeah well, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, you're also out of your club, I I'm like, po- I, you know, we're going back negative. I want to go positive. Oh yeah, that's right. Go positive. The positive that's right. Thing go is right, go right, that, right. that that as I said, this too shall pass, and science proceeds, Absolutely. and I think it's going to continue to proceed yeah. because right. it does pe- teach us to question ourselves, and it also teaches us there's so much more to learn. And I love the. I think the the end of. I think you said somewhere the closest thing to infinity. I've ever it's observed hope. this hope. I've seen infinity yeah. in the hope in the face of hope in the faces and imaginations of my South African students. And I think yeah. what you and I both hope is that is that we will see what drives both of us, I think, is the hope that we can get by turning someone on so that they can feel oh, yeah. the amazing wonder and awe in the universe that you were lucky enough, in spite oh, yeah. of a very unusual beginning to be able to experience and i've experienced for in, in many ways also i mean neither of my parents finished high school but oh, nice. but but, There's two but of us. the hope is what we what we what the message i want to give is that the universe yeah. is too fascinating to get wrapped up in the nonsense and let us Absolutely. let us and don't focus the, on the low character people you know yeah, look don't at focus those. on the low character people. Yeah. it's that i i thought the statement that you're if I yeah. to resonate with me a lot, there's yeah. always going to be a distribution. And if you right. focus and if we give too much attention to the low character people, it distorts yeah. the whole thing. And we don't realize how many people of goodwill there are and how Absolutely. interesting and wonderful the universe can exactly. be. And how yeah. wonder and how lucky we are to be here. I'm Absolutely. lucky to be able to have talked yeah. to you. And I'm lucky yeah, you man. spent the time with me. You sure are lucky to talk to me. <laughs> anyway, <I'm, laughs> okay. hey, by the way, yeah. I first met you on How the Universe Works, man. Not in person, but I saw you. That's how I first discovered that you exist. Yeah. And I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> He's taking my whole, he explains stuff so well. What is that? There you go. But then I joined you on, on season three. So. Yeah, that's right. I, that's right. So I, and now, of course, what that does is, of course, make me feel old, but I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hey, here's I what you got to do, man. If, you got to invite I, me to your backyard telescope sometime yeah, okay. and pay for me to get there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's been great. You take care. So I'm really, you, you know, I'm really happy we got to have this chance to talk. I look forward Same. to doing it in person. Um, you take care. Same, man. And best, Same. best to you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.